Order, order, and welcome to today's session of the Transport Select Committee. Uh, today we'll be looking at uh, the issue of uh, rail ticket office closures. Uh, this is as part of our wider uh, inquiry into accessibility issues uh, in transport. Uh, before I invite the panel to introduce themselves, can I just place on record our thanks to all the submissions that we've received uh, from organisations and members of the public uh, sharing their concerns and experiences, which has been very helpful uh, in uh, giving us a background to today. Uh, so could I invite the panel uh, to introduce themselves, state your name and organisation, please. We can start with uh, Katie. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Pennock. I'm the Campaigns and Communications Manager at Transport for All and we are the disabled-led organisation working towards equal access to transport and streets for disabled people across the UK. Thank you. I'm Louise Rubin. I'm Head of Policy and Campaigns at Scope, the Disability Equality Charity. Thank you. Morning, Mick Lynch, General Secretary of the RMT Union. Thank you. I'm Christopher Brooks. I'm Head of Policy at Age UK, the Older People's Charity. Thank you and welcome all and thank you for giving us uh, your time uh, this morning. Uh, before we get into some of the, the sort of issues of substance uh, with uh, these proposals, I'd like first just to ask um, for your thoughts on the actual consultation process and where we are. Uh, I'm aware there were considerable <coughs> concerns initially about the 21-day consultation period, which has been extended, and, and we now have, I believe, uh, 680,000 submissions to uh, the, the two bodies who are, are assessing this. Do you think that volume of uh, submissions gives them uh, an opportunity to properly encapsulate the, the, the range of concerns, or are there still missing pieces? Katie, if I could ask you first to... Uh, give a comment. Yeah, I, I'm, it's very, it's, I'm very glad to see that 680,000 people did response, and I think that goes some way to demonstrate the enormity of public feeling on this issue. I would say that disabled people have not had a fair opportunity to comment on the proposals that will disproportionately impact us. Uh, so a few comments about the accessibility of the consultation process itself. I refer to the letter sent to you a few days ago by the Rail Minister, who in the letter claimed that all train operators had published their EQIAs on their websites and that they had taken considerable steps to provide materials in accessible formats. In actual fact, operators did not initially make alternative accessible formats available and it wasn't until several operators were under the threat of legal action from disabled campaigners that they made some of these documents available and the deadline was extended. But where these formats did exist, they were often difficult to get hold of. Uh, not all formats were available. Um, I experienced one instance where I asked for British Sign Language and I was offered Braille instead, which is obviously not an adequate uh, substitution. Um, so any consultation, but especially one on proposals that will disproportionately impact disabled people, is rendered useless if it's not accessible to the very people who will be impacted. Um, and even now, to this day, there are still formats missing. So, for example, uh, operators that never made their formats, uh, never made their consultation materials accessible in Braille include C2C, East Midlands, Great Northern, Northern, Southern and South Western Railway and Thameslink. Uh, two operators uh, didn't publish their consultations in British Sign Language. They were C2C and Chiltern Railways. Um, and then the following operators uh, only had their EQIAs available in PDFs, which are not accessible to everyone. And they were Avanti West Coast, CTC, Chiltern Railways, Great Western Railway, South Western Railway, and Trans Pennine Express. Uh, just, I mean, that's just on the accessibility of the formats themselves, um, but that doesn't say anything about the, the process of the consultation. I mean, it took my team, um, the campaigns and policy team at Transport for All, the, I mean, the six weeks that the consultation was open to kind of pour over the consultation materials, and we are all people with um, professional expertise in this background, will have a background in rail policy, and even then it was really difficult to tease out the, the substance and the details in the consultations themselves. 
Um, and I, I'm really disappointed to see the kind of the opaqueness of these consultation documents and the number of misleading statements there were in the <coughs> documents, particularly around staffing. Thank you. Uh, Louise, I ask for your opinion on whether the, the consultation, the volume of consultation captures uh, the full range of uh, concerns and experiences. Yeah. I mean, I think Katie summed it up perfectly. Clearly, the number of responses demonstrates the strength of feeling amongst not just the disabled community, but lots of people who are deeply concerned about these proposals. And like Transport for All, we have found the process itself quite worrying. Um, Very quickly, we were hearing from disabled people who told us that the posters up in stations, which were the primary form of getting this proposal across to people, um, were too often out of the line of sight for wheelchair users. They were in parts of the station that nobody ever visited. They were not accessible to people with uh, visual impairments. So we, like Transport for All, have found it uh, not not, not particularly accessible. And again, trying to find the details on websites, on the individual train operating companies' websites, was beyond challenging. Um, They were buried in deep corners of websites. They were not in fonts and contrasts that were accessible for people. Um, And beyond that, I think... The, the, the very short length of this process, albeit that it was extended slightly, um, it's just unforgivable. I think it's left disabled and elderly people feeling overlooked from, from the very beginning, from the outset. It's, it's, it's as if uh, nobody actually wants to hear their opinions. Thank you. Mr Lynch? Well, it's been a sham, and everyone knows it, but we're going to get far more than 700,000. The response is the 680 figure is online electronic returns. They've not counted the paper returns as far as we know we could be going to three quarters of a million which is the biggest response ever received we understand they these companies have threatened our people lnr are here today they threatened our people with disciplinary action for wearing save our ticket office badges and putting little posters up in their ticket offices so they were trying to force it through in three weeks they didn't they weren't interested in a mass response they weren't interested in engagement this is cuts Reform and modernisation are the two most abused words in this building. Uh, This is a a fig leaf for cuts, mass cuts to staff and mass cuts to provision. And they're not interested in what we're all supposed to be interested in, the turn up and go social model of uh, accessibility and disability. They just want to ram this through to save money. They wanted to save 95 million. They spent 1.5 billion on the dispute in, in trying to fight this. And they've got something that's grown out of any proportion. So there would have been more responses, I think, if they hadn't hidden away the consultation documents, as we've seen, hidden away the stuff in the stations. And they're not interested in in what goes on. They keep punting out these figures of 12% uh, that people aren't buying tickets. The ticket offices are vibrant at the moment. If you go out anywhere on the network, there are people queuing out the door. This figure of 12%, I think, is a friction. I'll c- come on to some of the yeah. I'm, What I'm interested in at the outset is I appreciate the concerns about how the operators went about the consultation. What I'm trying to dig down into is the responses that have come in. Do they give a full spectrum of the concerns or are there parts missing? Well, there will be parts missing because some people still don't know about it, but it has been a a massive response that was unexpected. But we think the whole thing has been a sham designed to be uh, rammed through while people were looking the other way. And it all goes back to the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State initiated these changes through the contracts he has with the TOX. He directs everything they do these days. Every letter that's sent, he gets uh, access to. And, of course, if, if the watchdogs object on the limited basis they're allowed to, the decision will end up with him as well. So it's a controlled show. The whole thing is designed so that they can force this through in a way that they want. And I will come on to all those issues later. Uh, but Mr Brooks, uh, your uh, opinion on the consultation process? Yeah, well, clearly 680,000 responses is a lot. But I think it could have been higher, actually, if um, it was done in a more accessible manner. And also it was very fragmented. So it's clearly a national level change that's being implemented across the network. So... I think there could have been a bit more ownership centrally of it and trying to advertise the consultation more effectively through those routes. Plus, I mean, the fact, obviously, it was initially done as a 21-day consultation over the holiday season um, does lead to um, the the suspicion that it could have been done in that manner to sort of minimise responses. And obviously, it was then subsequently extended, which is a good thing. 
Um, but I think there are still probably a number of people who haven't responded, um, particularly lo older people who are likely to be offline and maybe find it harder to respond to these things, yet have very strong feelings and are adversely affected by the proposals. Thank you. Um, now, the operators have published their e equality impact assessments of the proposals. How robust uh, do you think those are? Uh, and if you don't think they're robust, can you give us some specific examples of where uh, you think they, they fall short? Katie, I could go back Before to Before I comment on the individual talks EQIAs, mm. I just want to quickly raise the issue of the missing EQIA, which is that that the department should have made um, programme-wide. Um, because while the individual talks have made an assessment of the impacts at individual stations, we're missing the identification of accumulative impacts um, we've been trying our hardest to get hold of this EQIA, which we really feel disabled people should have had access to before responding to a public consultation. On the 11th of July, we submitted a freedom of information to a request to the Department for Transport. Um, on the last day of the consultation, on the 34th, 31st of August, the department responded to reject this request. Um, stating that they were withholding the information under the formulation of government policy exemption, um, going on to say that ministers and officials need a safe space away from public scrutiny to formulate and develop the proposals. Now, I would argue that during a public consultation, that's exactly when you do want public scrutiny of that policy. Um, but going on to the EQIAs that were made available from the train operators, although, as I've mentioned already, these were not always accessible, um, I mean, I've, the, my criticisms of the EQIAs could fill an entire session, so I'll try and give you a whistle-stop tour. Um, overarching comments, it really does demonstrate a total lack of understanding of the barriers that disabled people face along the rail. For example, um, East Midlands Railway, they identify a potential impact of blind and visually impaired passengers being unable to use ticket vending machines. So their suggested solution is that EMR will work with local sight loss charities and hold information sessions that will support customers learning how to use a TVM. Similarly, C2C says that we're happy to spend time showing customers how machines work. Now, the suggestion that it is simply a lack of knowledge on how to use TVMs is the barrier to using them is frankly insulting. Um, another example demonstrating the lack of understanding is Great Northern, who say that the removal of hearing loops will somehow allow better communication as staff will be in the concourse, which is louder. Uh, so that will, I don't see how that will benefit deaf and hard of hearing passengers. Um, a question that arose for me when poring over these many, many documents, uh, totaling thousands and thousands of pages, is what expertise have operators drawn upon in making these assessments? Um, it is unclear what engagement they have, what proactive engagement they have done with disabled people and our organisations, and certainly our organisation was not reached out to or contacted during the development of these proposals from train operator companies. Um, so how can we be satisfied that they have adequately identified all potential impacts if they don't have that expertise available? Um, a lot of the documents are copy and paste jobs. I think Chilton is particularly um, guilty of that. Most of the individual assessments for each station are word for word copied for each station, which don't take into account the, the sort of specific circumstances in each area. Um, and all of the EQIAs done, they rely upon the proposed mitigations not only actually being implemented, and there's nothing to hold DOCS account for doing that, but also on them working successfully. Um, and we don't have confidence that the mitigations will be in place and will work by the time that ticket offices are set to shut. Um, for example, there's no time frame for any of this. So several talks have said, well, you know, we're going to put a TVM in every station that will accept cash, or we're going to make sure that we have an accessible TVM at each station. When? By what deadline? When is that happening? And with what money? With what funding? There's no detail on any of that. Um, I'm sure you must have seen a photo doing the rounds on Twitter recently um, of a permit to travel machine at Hatton Station, um, which currently has no ticket office and no ticket machine. Um, it's operated by Chilton, who I know you're speaking to later on in the session. Um, 
The photo shows that this machine doesn't accept the new one pound coins, which were issued in 2017. It is a niche example, but it's one that demonstrates the speed at which operators might be bringing in their modifications and mitigations that they've proposed. Um, some of the mitigations identified are simply not mitigated at all. Some of the impacts are not mitigated at all. Uh, so, for example, back to Great Northern, they say that okay. we're aware... I need to bring in other people as well to okay. quickly summarise, please. Yeah, they've identified many, many impacts which are severe and severely curtail disabled people's rights and freedoms, and several of them have not been mitigated whatsoever. Uh, so we have no faith in these EQAs. Thank you. Do any of the other panel? Well, firstly, do the other panelists agree with uh, that assessment, or do you have a counter view or uh, further points you'd like to make? Well, I agree with that assessment. But what strikes us going round is this whole the point that was made at the start there, the whole system analysis, which is the job of the RDG or the DFT, because the RDG doesn't doesn't exist in some ways. It's just a a club. But if you want to travel between two points, you've got to ensure that the system is there, not just on your line or in your place with your company, because we have a national network operated by individual companies, and there is no whole system equality impact uh, that will mean you can turn up and go and rely that when you're doing your interchanges, which may involve bridges, all sorts of impediments uh, and crossings, that you're going to have staff available at every point, and the onus will be on the individual to book all that. They don't, I don't think they care about this. All these equality impact statements are afterthoughts to make the thing go through in the three-week period as it originally was. So it's, it's, it's just superficial and it's without meaning is what we've seen from these impact statements. Thank you. And, and quickly, any additional points before I turn to colleagues? Yeah, and just briefly, I think that there's, there's a lack of understanding about how difficult it is for people who aren't internet users and computer users to use sort of automated machines. Um, it, it's, it's extremely difficult. I mean, it's difficult to comprehend if you're a tech-savvy person who regularly uses computers, but it is extremely difficult to expect someone to go on to a, into, a, into a station and use a TVM and be able to use the interface. However intuitive some tech-savvy designer thinks it is, it is very, very difficult, probably impossible for many, many people who are offline. And we still have over a fifth of over 65s are not internet users. And so for them to expect people to go into a station and do, do that is, is extremely tall order. Any additional points? Or? Yeah, I just think it's, I just want to agree with the point that Mick made about the system needing to work across the entire network because when people leave their home, they will be travelling from point A to point B. And something that's come up frequently from the disabled people that we've spoken to is that they don't have confidence that the journey will go as planned. So even if you're familiar with your local station and what you need to get through when you're in your local station you don't know what you're going to find at the other end and these inconsistencies across the network are what really frighten people and uh, make them lose confidence in, in taking that journey on. Thank you. Uh, Zara if I could turn to you next. Thank you Chair. So train operating companies are, are saying that by taking people out of the ticket offices and moving them onto the station will help people with their needs. Do you think there's any merit to this? <coughs> I, 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 I think we have little faith that there will be enough staff to make this work. So we have heard <coughs> from DFT that no station will be unstaffed, but it doesn't take long to start going through the, the TOX proposals to see that that's simply not true. We've got numerous examples of TOX saying that there will be a mobile staffing unit that will visit the station one or two times a week or that that the offices will be partially stuffed. Now, that's not good enough. Disabled people have the right to travel <coughs> when they need to travel. We can't expect disabled people to limit their travel to, to, to suit the ticket office uh, schedule. Um, so, no, we don't have confidence that this can work. We don't believe there will be enough staff to make it work. But even if there were, disabled people want to know where they can find them. And when you look at some of the bigger stations, we cannot comprehend how you can expect disabled people to find roving members of staff. People take a lot of comfort and reassurance from knowing that there is a ticket office and that is where they can go to ask questions to get help when in inevitably things go wrong on the journey. We just don't understand how it can work. Is there anybody that wants to? Yeah. Yeah. So a quarter of the people are to be made redundant. A quarter of the jobs are going to be cut on stations. 2,300. The companies have notified us that already under the statutory letter. So they're not taking them out of the ticket office to work on the platforms. They're taking them out of the ticket office to make cuts 
to cut the jobs out of the systems. And it's just a, a, a nonsense that these people will all be redeployed. They're cutting the hours, cutting the deployment, and for people who need to travel, which is often off-peak, that will be the very hours that people will, that staff will not be there. They'll put people there chiefly in the peak hours when it suits the companies, not when it suits many pensioners and others that come out after the early morning rush and all the rest of it. So they will be left to fend for themselves. And I think business people find it hard to understand the fear that that puts into people's minds about travel. And the, Schedule 17, which is the thing that been, has been abolished, which we've been... Um, consulted under means that is the only means by which you can guarantee staff will be there it's a regulation that is being abolished when this is abolished and if it goes through there will be no regulation for any of these train operating companies to put any staff on any station whatsoever so what you're having now is a temporary measure to get this through and in two years time there will be barely anyone working on stations on our railway because there will be nothing to stop them de-staffing it. And they will say it's not efficient, uh, and even the measures that they're putting in, which are only promises, they're not business commitments, they're not regulations, they're not <coughs> a record. They are commitments to get this consultation through. So you can't rely on it and you can't trust them. They are going to cut the staff and cut accessibility. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely the case. <clears throat> Disabled people need staffed stations. Due to our hideous Victorian infrastructure, there's a massive step to get onto the train. I need someone to bring out a manual boarding ramp to help me get on. Blind and visually impaired people may require sight guiding through stations. This is particularly an issue with, due to the lack of tactile paving on platform edges, which means that navigating a station independently is dangerous for many blind and, uh, blind and visually impaired people. Um, people who have mental health <coughs> conditions or learning disabilities or cognitive impairments uh, may need a bit of extra support safely navigating a station, particularly if it's crowded. Um, all, all of these use cases of staff demonstrate that staff need to be visible, they need to be located. Now, this idea that staff currently being behind the glass is a problem that needs to be fixed is not the case at all. It's actually one of the most important accessibility features of a ticket office. It's a designated place where disabled people can go and be assured that they will find assistance from that place. Um, this idea of moving staff into multifunctional roles where they could be anywhere on any of the platforms or anywhere in the concourse or indeed anywhere else um, requires disabled people to arrive at a station and go traipsing around a station trying to find this member of staff. Um, and these disabled people may have energy limiting impairments, we may have mobility impairments. Um, I already experience the impact of this because um, one of the stations that I use very frequently has already closed their ticket office on some days, it now shuts at 1pm on a Saturday. Um, so if I want to travel on a Saturday afternoon, I go to the ticket off office, it's shut, no one's there, I have to find a member of staff. I have to push myself up a ramp over the footbridge, down the other ramp, check one platform, and do the same, and check the entire station. That is completely unreasonable. On that point, then, do you think there is any way to be able to shut the ticket offices uh, at all um, to help those who need uh, help with their accessibility? Is there any way to do this? So something that's been suggested is this idea of a, of a, of a designated point where staff will be. And we know that um, some operators have already rolled this out at several other stations. So Chilton already have this customer-focused approach at their stations, including Oxford Parkway and Bicester. And what that is, is they have a big information desk that is fully staffed all of the time, usually by two members of staff. And that desk can take cash payments. It can sell any type of ticket that exists, including the D35 and D50 discounts that aren't available online or at TVMs. Um, and they have staff who can provide assistance, can book you a taxi if the lift's out of order, all of those things. It has a hearing loop as well. There is, for all intents and purposes, <coughs> no difference between that and a ticket office. The only difference, as Mick has already highlighted, is that there is no regulatory ob obligation for a train operator to keep staff at that help desk. Schedule 17 only applies to the ticket office. So we can have a ticket office 2.0 
Um, and there's absolutely nothing in place to ensure that TOCS will actually keep staff at that information desk. It's, it's unmandatory and unregulated, and they can remove it whenever they wish with no consultation. And that's what they want to happen. So Steve Montgomery, who sat here and said there are no plans to close ticket offices, and then he's going to close a thousand of them virtually, has said to me face to face, any hubs that we bring in will be temporary while we update TVMs and do other measures until we get all the technology that we want. Any uh, information point or any passenger hub, which is the term you'll hear, hear later on, will be a temporary measure until the full transition comes in and there will be no uh, infrastructure, desks, windows, whatever you like, glass. There will be nothing in the future. That's what we had in the 90s on Silverlink going around North London. No ticket offices, no staff, nothing. Do you want to add to that? Well, I mean, there's not much to add, really. That I think Katie explained it all really, really clearly. Um, I, would, I mean, I would just second it, really, and just say that um, I think the beauty of ticket office is precisely that people know where to go to get assistance. And obviously they're very popular, and the staff in ticket offices are extremely helpful, and with the limitations on technology available in the stations, particularly navigating the very complex fare system and accessing the best deals, um, it, it's, in, it's really important that, that that service is maintained and it, it sort of the proposals don't seem to really stack up I mean they're just they're, they're, they're just clearly going to be a watered down version of that support and with other limitations on what people can, tickets that people can purchase and the assistance that people can receive. So just to follow on from that point and it's being reiterated a lot that this is a consultation process, what changes do you think need to be made to the proposals to make sure that we are helping those with accessibility needs? Well, I mean, I think it, in, in theory, you could probably deliver this in other ways, the support that people need. Um, however, in practice, as Mick said, it's probably about cutting costs and about um, reducing staff numbers, which is going to lead to poorer levels of customer service and the, the, the people that really need support, the older and the disabled people who, who are really in need of the support, will, will find it harder and harder to access it. Um, so, I mean, th there's nothing in the proposals, really, that, that is better than a ticket office. I think a ticket office probably trumps it on most counts. You could probably deliver it in an alternative way if it's adequately resourced. Paul. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, um, you know, Mick, you and I had a corridor conversation the mm. other week on this subject mm. as well. I mean, it's, it seems to me as though there's two different conversations going on here. Uh, one of which is the concept of closing ticket offices, and the other one is actually what's going to happen next. You know, if, if you look at what um, Katie said a minute ago, I think it was Bisti you said, where there's an example of what would be a good, or potentially good system with people there managing it, it it's, it's managed, it's providing the services, it's not a ticket office, but therefore but it's there doing the sort of things that we've been told is what they're talking about transitioning to. But because there's no regulatory enforcement of that to remain there, that is the bigger. Uh, that, uh, I'm sensing that that's the bigger issue. Rather than the transition to a pod type service that might be located on the service, that has to be multi man to make sure it has consistency. But the fact that that could then be taken away later without, because of the way the regulation sits, is that the real problem that sits? Well, yes. Katie and then Mick on, on that one first. I would say that the two examples I've used on Vista and Oxford Parkway, and they pertain to Chilton, those are the only examples where we've seen this ticket literally duplicating the ticket office approach. So the contents of the proposals put forward by all of the other operators don't go into anywhere near that level of replicating what we have already. But if you, sorry, just to interrupt, but if, but if you had a situation where that was the, the thing that was going to be put in some way mandated as the way that things would have happened, that would, would that be a, a better situation than where we are now, a worse situation, or just be exactly the same? It would be exactly the same. The, the, then there's no point to any of this. It really is literally a ticket office, just without glass. Well, you know... When we went into the negotiations, we were expecting uh, a modernisation package. We haven't got a modernisation package. We've got a closure package. There's no modernisation coming in on the back of this. There is no promise of greater accessibility. So if we were to have a real... They need to drop these plans. And if they want to talk about uh, greater accessibility, different retail measures and different styles of hubs or customer service centres, 
well, let's have that conversation. But they're, they're going to be turned into Costa Coffees. This is, this is, I was at Penzance Station. Network Rail have already closed the current outlet, which is a family business, in order to bring corporate multinational companies in to sell very expensive uh, hot drinks to people that you can get everywhere you go, which is what our country country's turning into in the high street, which is why people are so angry about... These are community centres in many towns and villages. I've been up to Berwick, I've been down to Penzance, been all over the country. People are going absolutely crackers about losing more after the banks, the pubs, every community asset being closed down. If we want a, an accessible railway that's friendly for everyone, and don't forget, if it's accessible for disabled people, it will be accessible for our foreign visitors who we want. It will be accessible for everyone. It will be accessible for women who, want, who are fearful about travelling. If we want that modern offer, why have we not got a proposal on it? What, even the hours they've got are cuts to hours. And it's every person for themselves on the railway. And once the sun's gone down, many people will not want to travel on this railway in the future. That's what we're seeing, uh, a fairly apocalyptic version of what the railway will be like. An unsocial behaviour will go up. We're not talking about that today. But if it's accessible for elderly people, for people with disabilities, people with learning difficulties... It's going to be great for the rest of us as well because there'll be lots of staff around directing us, assisting us, and that's what we want. But we've got no proposals like that whatsoever. And so it's, it's just, so, so it just it, 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 it's the lack of clarity uh, and specificity, if that's a good word, um, as to where it's going to finish up. And lack of regulation. Term. You yeah. need regulation to make these companies do or at least a what, framework. Yeah. what the government and the DFT and uh, policy makers specify. You will have an unspecified railway. This is what this consultation is about. There's no specification for what they have to do on any station in Britain, even the biggest ones. So they will do what they like. Okay. Just, be, just before I lose that, that there, I just want to ask one specific question to yourself, Megan, and then I'll come to you, Louise. Um, just in terms of you know, your members and, and things, in terms of what's been potentially proposed, um, is there any additional training or is the difference or do the, your teams have the skill sets already for if, 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 if these things were going to happen is there some engagement that would be needed in that space just before I lose well they, they're committed to retraining people they're going to make people who've never done safety critical work do safety critical work they're going to make people who have never done ticketing work do retail work so we don't know how that's going to work and that's one of the so there will be some training discussions needs. well they're saying there will be but we don't know what that will include what they want to do first is cut the jobs they want to get on with redundancies as soon as they can and then make the best out of it after they've cleared everyone out. Okay, Louise, you obviously wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, perhaps what's getting slightly lost in all of this is that travelling by rail is already incredibly mm. difficult for disabled people. We're talking about how to make it better in the future as if it's as, it, as if that's what's on the cards, but actually we know it's dire already. So before these proposals were on the table, uh, we spoke to, to, to disabled people. Already 30% of people telling us they don't think their journey will go as planned. 50% saying that rail is inaccessible to them. Another 50% saying staff don't know how to help them and support them. It's already bad and there are 101 things that can go wrong on a rail journey if you are disabled from lack of information on the platforms to trains being diverted to passenger assist that you've booked not turning up 101 things um, the issue for us is, that is, is, is that removing ticket office staff can't possibly make that better now ticket offices don't solve all of those problems but what they do offer is that point of reassurance somewhere you can go and ask for help when things go wrong. We're just not reassured that there will be enough people walking around the platforms, walking around the concourse to offer that. Um, so actually when we start to look through the proposals, there's nothing to reassure us that travelling by rail is going to become more accessible when it's already in such a bad place to start. Okay, I mean my, my perception is if you, if you travel to various countries overseas, there's, you can stand there and you turn up and you look at the notice board to see what's happening. And almost before you've looked at it, there's somebody stood there saying, can I help you? Now, if you were to move to that sort of situation where you had that level of engagement from staff on a platform or the thing, that might be a better place than the all being sat behind glass doors, if you like. But it's that if in the first place. Isn't they it? might only do that two hours a day. And if you're not there for those no, two no, hours, no, you no, won't no, get no, any help at all. Yeah, That's okay. what they're promising. I follow the logic. Unfortunately, it's a very long way removed from what the plan's actually set yeah. out. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that, that's exactly what I'm trying to, to share, that there's a different 
position between the vision and what the plans seem to be implying at the moment. And can, can I just reassure you that the, the wider concerns you've uh, outlined about uh, accessibility needs, that, that's the purpose of our overall inquiry. We'll be, be looking at those in, in other sessions. Uh, but Jack, if I could uh, turn to you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And just firstly to Louise, is there yeah. people with specific disabilities who will be, <coughs> excuse me, more affected than others? Yeah, so from the conversations we've had uh, with disabled people, there are huge concerns about people with visual impairments because it's much, much harder, as you can imagine, to first of all use the websites to book tickets online or the apps beforehand. Not all of them are compatible with screen readers. And then when it comes to the ticket vending machines themselves, of course it's challenging to use those if you have a visual impairment. Many of them don't allow you to zoom in and find the information you need. Many of them are using kind of colours and fonts and contrasts that don't work. And then the other group that we've heard uh, an awful lot from, of course, are wheelchair users who are worried um, because oftentimes the ticket vending machines are not at the right height. They can't use them. Help points equally not always positioned as they should be um, and even when the help points are working and in the right place if there aren't staff at the station on the actual station that you are on to respond to those calls you're then looking at perhaps a 15 20 minute wait half an hour wait for someone to get to you where you are and assist you with a ramp or the other assistance that you might need and in terms of um, the specific issues, are there some stations and some operators that you're more concerned about than others? Yeah, looking through the uh, individual top consultations, there are some that stand out, and I think Katie actually mentioned some of them already, but um, East Midlands Railways, for example, have said in theirs that ticket offices will close, but we expect weekly visits, weekly visits from mobile staff at the stations how does that work if you need to get somewhere in a hurry, which does happen to disabled people as well as non-disabled people? Disabled people can't plan their lives around weekly visits. Equally, coast-to-coast -coast proposals state that some stations will be completely unstaffed or staffed for limited hours. Again, are we expecting disabled people to travel for one hour a day? And what happens if the trains are not running, which often happens, we've all experienced that. Um, and LNER have talked about <coughs> mobile teams providing assistance if a booking has been made. So what does that mean for our right to turn up and go? It <coughs> throws it completely into, into doubt. Any of our other witnesses have any points on that do you want to yeah I mean it? absolutely echoing everything that Louise said um, East Midlands Railways plans which Louise mentioned about these weekly visits those are 16 stations have been identified where that model will be introduced uh, for West Midland Railways that rises to 78 stations so the claim that there will be greater visibility of staff on concourses and platforms I don't see how that can line up with um, there only being staff for an hour per week. Um, also, with those weekly visits, you know, are they going to be scheduled? Is that going to be an hour slot that I know I can use that station? Or is that going to be kind of ad hoc? They may appear, they may not. We don't know. Um, many other stations will be co become completely un unstaffed on particular days. So uh, Southwestern has quite a few uh, stations like that. Um, such as Christchurch, which is set to become unstaffed on Mondays and Sundays. Again, is this a case of disabled people not being able to travel on those days? We don't know. Um, LNR said that there will be mobile teams will be, um, and that will be stationed at customer information centres at selected stations which have been specifically chosen in locations that are no more than an hour away from each other. It's completely ludicrous to suggest that um, disabled people should turn up at a station, call for help if they can use the help point, um, and wait up to an hour for a mobile team to come out to meet them. And that directly contradicts uh, the contents of uh, the rail operator's uh, accessible travel policies, which is a condition of their licence to provide timely assistance to disabled people. Disabled people have the right to turn up and go. We have the right to travel spontaneously. We don't know when meetings are going to end. We don't know when we'll be in a place at a given time. And we are also experiencing a multitude of other barriers, not just on the rail network, but across all forms of transport, which may delay our journey and, and throw plans up in the air. So it's absolutely vital that disabled people are able to travel spontaneously and turn up and go and require that assistance. And just a comment on help points, which has also been proposed 
as a solution in these stations which are set to become unstaffed or being visited by a, a mobile team once a week help points at the moment don't work i don't know if any of you have ever used a help point but the chances of you getting help from it are are very very slim in fact the rail regulator <coughs> orr which i understand you're speaking to later have conducted research on this and it found that 51 percent of their mystery shoppers only 51 percent were able to successfully get help from a help point um, if they were able to find it, locate it, if it was working, if they were able to speak to the operator and understand what they're saying um, and receive that assistance in a timely manner. That's half of journeys. We can't be suggesting that help points are an adequate solution when they only work half of the time. Um, and just another thing that it, you know, I'd be very grateful if you could put to the ORR um, later today, which is on this topic of regulation that we've touched upon already. Um, as we've laid out, the situation as it stands is dire. Um, and the ORR has only just released research uh, that said that in the year ending March 2023, just 81% of pre-booked passenger assistance requests resulted in all of that assistance being received. And that's for pre-booked, so that's booked, arranged in advance, you've got the confirmation email, it's all set in stone, only 80%. So one in five journeys uh, result in unsuccessful assistance. And, and what that means for me and millions of other disabled people means being stranded on trains that may not be terminating at that station, um, that's a, you know, th this is the current situation. And these are all the issues we're exploring elsewhere in the inquiry. I'm, I'm in interest of time, yeah, I need to in keep the, focused Just on to the bring it back up to the point, in terms of regulation, it, it, th this is the, the contents of the accessible travel transport policies, which is a condition of the franchising agreement. If this is the current situation, what are the ORR's um, powers to hold train operators to account. If this is what is currently happening, how how will those regulatory powers be exercised when things get worse, as they inevitably will? I wanted to ask a further question, particularly around um, Transport for London. Obviously, they closed a lot of their ticket offices in 2015. What What is the difference between what's proposed here uh, from what TFL have done and are there any lessons that should be learned? Maybe make a few on it. Well, it's very unsatisfactory that they did that. And, uh, of course, somebody with blonde hair promised that no ticket offices in London would close. That was a manifesto commitment when he stood for election, uh, that none of them would close whatsoever. So that shows how far you can go with some people making promises. The difference in London, you have a very simple fare structure that is easy for everyone to understand. And secondly, due to the King's Cross fire, we have fire regulations in every sub surface station with mandatory in law regulations about how many people have got to be on duty in the concourse in the tunnels on the platforms all around and if those people are not there those stations cannot open and have to be closed you have a completely different regulatory framework what you'll get with these proposals on as i've said before no rules regulations or requirements at all and the TVMs that we've t spoken about, I don't think they're even covered by any regulation. So a lot of people are talking about TVMs. I've been told by very senior people in this industry there will not be any TVMs. TVMs are going to be phased out and they are a temporary measure and the assistance you will get is how to use your phone. And if you haven't got one or aren't very good at them, you won't get any help at all. You won't be able to buy a ticket. They, you might be interested to ask what their plans are for TVMs, but the maintenance schedules on them already uh, have completely fallen to pieces. They're dilapidated and very often do not work at all. Again, this is a stepping stone to get this through, this reliance on TVMs, which are sometimes on staircases, in the middle of staircases, but they will not be around at all because it costs money for contractors to come and uh, fix them and for staff to go and reset them, and they don't want staff. Well, the Rail Delivery Group have suggested that they will um, ensure that those ticket machines are upgraded and want to see those upgraded. Would that help? Um, uh, is it a requirement? Well, that, that's what they've said, that they want it to, to see them improve yeah, but and upgrade. The, the, the chair told us that they wouldn't be shut in the ticket office. There were no plans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can just I come in, in on just, the... You, I think you've come in enough. We want to ask some of the other witnesses some of the questions. But in terms of um, the, the other issues that I was going to ask you, Mick, you mentioned about modernisation. 
Um, mm. Is what what was your view in terms of modernisation? What what should that have uh, looked like in, in in your view? Well, we haven't had a modernisation proposal, but any proposals have to take on board the social mo- model of accessibility and disability, and they has to have an updated retail offer where you can buy tickets and buy permits for your journey at the station. Right. And if you don't have that, we would have de staff stations. So if they want to talk about how we update retail, we can do that. We have updated retail, but what they are doing is already limiting what can be sold on ticket office uh, machines. They're not updating those. So we already have a limited amount that can be sold and everyone you will speak to will say they would prefer the interaction with the the ticket clerk because they get a better value and you've got to remember when it's all done through apps uh, and AI and uh, algorithms the the train companies will be able to sell you the tickets (coughs) they want you to buy not the one that you may need or be better value and you get that from human interaction they want to take the human out of this so that they can just download into you the ticket they want you to buy and make you take the journey that they want you to take. In terms of Age UK, is this a particular barrier in terms of the current technology of some of those ticket machines and the barriers that they present, Chris? Yeah, it's a huge barrier for people. Um, as I've said already, I think um, the TVMs, no matter how intuitively designed they are, there are lots of people, uh, still over one in five, over 65s, don't use the internet. And there's no upgrades that could, you know, or changes that could be made that would mean that they would be to a standard where everybody could use those. Is that, is that the case? Is that yeah, the I think so. I think, I think if, you're, if you're not familiar with using technology and computers, you can't really just be expected to turn up in a station and use, a, use an automatic um, machine to help you choose the right fare, especially with the complex fare structure we have. So maybe that's a reform that needs to be looked at at first. Um, but I, and I think it's, it's the human assistance is just really important for people as well. So... Um, if you're offline, you, you, people are more dependent on that personal assistance. Um, and there, there are lots of people, it's not just the one in five who are offline, about over half of over 65s are narrow internet users, so they can only do a sort of a limited range of activities online as well. So they will find it very challenging as well. I think there's just a, a significant number of people, like millions of pensioners, who will find it very, very difficult if, if we go down a more automated route. And it will obviously have the impact that it will put some people off travelling altogether, whereas others will probably travel less. And uh, their Do you lives have any sort of data on that of you know how many people maybe have suggested that this will put them off uh, travelling altogether? Have you been able to collect any information on that? No, I don't have any information. I've just heard anecdotally from people saying contacting us saying that they they would find it very difficult to travel. So that I don't think it's been quantified anywhere. Right. Um, but I mean, I would suspect that there, 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 are, I mean, there are about two and a half million pensioners who are offline. So I think even if it just puts off a small proportion of those people from travelling, you could easily see how, how it, it could sort of cost in the hundreds of thousands of journeys a year, potentially. I, just on that, Sorry, comment. I, I need to, if we've got time at the end, I'll come back in. But I've got other colleagues who'd like to ask questions. Carl. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Um, my colleague Jack just asked a question that I was going to ask of the panel, so I'll ask the two, but then come to you, Mick, if that's okay. Um, specifically, have your organisations done any polling of your members, or have you a figure of journeys that might not be made on the <coughs> railways, should the worst case scenario and all these changes be brought in? Do you have any idea of figures? We, do, <coughs> we haven't done exactly that question. We haven't asked exactly that question, but we, we, we've asked a number of questions about the impact of this. Um, and of people that told us that they would find ticket vending machines inaccessible, the, the largest majority, around 80%, told us that it's because they don't know what fare they need or what ticket they need. Um, and they, they, they get that information from going to a, a ticket office. For the rest, about 10% told us that they, they depend on cash. And we know that disabled people, more than non-disabled people, do rely on cash. It's often harder to get access to a bank account. So there were big concerns amongst 10% who were worried that they wouldn't be able to use cash cash and that they don't have a a contactless uh, approach. Um, 5% told us that ticket vending machines are at the wrong height for them and another 5% told us that they can't see, they can't zoom in, they can't read the machines themselves. 
specifically on that question, Katie? Yeah, uh, it's good to see that our uh, research matches up because we found very similar things uh, uh, in our research that we've done. Um, uh, 12% of disabled people use the ticket office to buy their <clears throat> tickets when using rail. Um, 10% use cash. Um, and then 37% of disabled people have faced barriers to rail due to low staffing in the last year alone. 36% experience issues with booking or receiving assistance in the past year. And um, that's obviously something that is heavily tied to ticket offices and staffing ability. Thank you, Katie. Chris, I'm not going to come to you because you've sort of asked it. Mick, surprisingly, we might be on the same side of this issue. Um, <laughs> but in a more general sense, and you and your members know the railways perhaps better than most. Um, what are your feelings? If all these changes went through, what, what do you think would be the downturn? There's not going to be an upturn in people using the railway. And bottom line, it's about money. We want to get more people using the railways. What, what do you think is... Well, I think we're going to have a, what might be a hostile environment for not just dis, uh, disabled people with physical impairments and pensions. You've got to remember there's lots of people with learning disabilities. Uh, the blind groups aren't represented here today who I've seen out on, on the, the demos and on the activities. They are up in arms about this. Um, and the guidance they get from staff and the understanding they have from staff, almost on a one-to-one -one when they're regular travellers, is, cannot be underestimated. So I think this is a dash for cuts. It will affect our people, but, I mean, that's maybe not your concern. That, but it but will affect... the percentage of, of journeys that are made maybe today that perhaps won't be made in the future, not just from disabled well, we, groups... We should be looking for growth. We should be looking for growth exactly. that all people can feel that the, the railway is theirs, that it's an environment that they can trust and the buses as well, all of these public transport things. And we should be looking for people to be less locked in to their houses and their own lives and getting out into communities and paying a full role. And we hope that our members can serve those people and be part of that accessibility drive. That's where we should be looking. And we think this is just a means by which you can cut staff and the consequences are, have not been thought through. Mm -hmm. Nobody's looking at a new transport system that is modernised, I think, using technology as a friend to people rather than something that's going to obstruct them. And the, uh, the groups that we've met um, are completely hostile to these proposals. They want the opposite. If we want a modern railway, let's modernise it and let's not go back to de-staffing that we've had in many situations you already. And make it welcoming. Yes, exactly, yeah. Thank you, mate. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Graham. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, wonder if, I wonder if I might ask um, Katie, I know, I know um, we're under a bit of time pressure, but you're familiar with the letter that the committee received from the Rail Minister on the 10th of September about the issue of ticket office closures. There's two, two things, at least two things, that, that, that struck me. What is the fact that he acknowledges that ticket offices aren't just used to purchase tickets? Because uh, one of the um, reasons it's given is that only 12% uh, of the tickets are bought um, through ticket offices. Uh, but he does acknowledge that people go there for advice, assistance and so on. So I think that's a positive. But he also refers a little later on to the ticketing and settlement agreement, the TSA. Now, I, I took note of the point that the, the panellists, including Mick, made about Schedule 17 being the only statutory protection. I'm thinking about what we as a committee can do in terms of making recommendations to government if they are going to press ahead with some form of... Uh, of um, of redeployment or whatever they're going to call it, should we be seeking them reinforcing the, t the ticketing and settlement agreement with operators? That's a really good question and I, I noted actually something that struck me in that letter uh, is that the Minister talks about, as you've identified, the fact that the ticket office plays a role far beyond just selling tickets. Um, but he said that the department does not hold data on the number of customer interactions between customers and staff that are not retailing interactions. So, I mean, I, I just don't see how this can be pitched as a case of improving a service when there is no data on the current level of service. Um, so I think that's a bit of a gap there. Um, w with regards to the, the Schedule 17, I mean, I, um, as, as we have talked about already quite a bit, the, the staff at the ticket office are the only staff that are regulatory meant to be yeah. there. The the only thing that we could see that would be acceptable would be um, changing, amending that, which I believe is the Railways Act, I'm not entirely sure, um, to ensure that the, the current level of staff remains the same. But again, we go back to the point of, well, then what on earth is the point in all of this? Um, and... 
yeah, I, 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 I think it's really, really important. Um, perhaps that's something you could also put to the ORR in terms of what other regulatory powers do they have in ensuring that staffing levels are maintained. And also, you know, we've already talked about how this current situation is dire. I've given examples of stations I've seen that have already reduced their staffing levels, have already closed their ticket office. So from our point of view, we, we would like to see an increase in staff. That's what we're fighting for. <coughs> and that's what's so demoralised about this entire conversation is that my best case scenario in all of this is that things don't get worse but we won't have secured progress I can kind of um, uh, uh, empathise with your experience Uh, I I missed Transport Select Committee last Wednesday because I was on an HS2 visit to the viaducts and tunnelling system and Chiltern Railways were excellent, the trains were wonderful lovely and clean and everything but I bought my ticket at Marylebone and when I tried to get out at Rickmansworth there weren't any staff around and I had to climb over the barrier, which is no mean feat for me because I've got two bad knees. <laughs> but yeah, and there's nobody to help, is there? You yeah. know. Not, wouldn't have been quite possible for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Gavin. Um, <clears throat> thanks so much, Jim. Um, two, two, very, two quick yes no questions, I'm conscious of time. Um, you'll be aware, at least I assume you'll be aware that um, last year ScotRail had a similar consultation with regard to ticket offices, although they only proposed to close three um, ticket offices in Scotland. Consultation occurred, that a similar response uh, was received um, and it was listened to and the closures were reversed. First question, do you have, any, do you have the similar confidence that the UK government will listen to the results of the consultation as <coughs> happened in Scotland? And secondly, uh, during the urgent question uh, before recess, I asked the Minister why the Glasgow Central ticket office, Avanti ticket office at Glasgow was being closed, whereas the LNER ticket office in Edinburgh was remaining open. Um, and uh, there's no real answer to that. As far as I understand it, more than double the amount of tickets are bought at, an o- at the office at Glasgow as at Edinburgh, but yet the Edinburgh one is remaining open. Do any of you understand why that decision has been made? So. Um, on the consultation and on the ticket office, Katie? Just very quickly, um, no is the short answer. I don't have trust in the government to listen to the responses of the consultation, um, particularly around the fact that this directive seems to have come from the department itself. Mm -hmm. Um, So as we know, the consultation has ended. It's currently with the passenger bodies to um, make a decision. Um, And if an agreement can't be reached between the passenger bodies and the operators, then that gets escalated to the Secretary of State, uh, which I believe is a case (coughs) of marking one's own homework. Okay. Take office, no idea why. Glasgow. I don't know about the, <coughs> the Glasgow example, I'm afraid. No, no nobody knows. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, no. Um, it does, and I hate to say it, but it does appear to be a done deal. The only hope that we've got at the moment is that the two uh, watchdogs will do a good job of going through those thousands and thousands of consultation responses and pushing back on the mitigations that the talks have suggested, making them stronger, making them viable. But in terms of this going ahead, I think it's going to happen. Well, one's first group and the other one's the uh, office of uh, last resort. Not last resort, was it? <laughs> Whatever it's called. <laughs> Maybe it is last resort. Uh, but on the, on the process, I haven't got much faith. This process is not designed uh, for this level of closure. We've only closed 23 ticket offices in the last 10 years. And it's normally about sections, about limited areas. And then you can see the watchdog could do a decent job. What are the mitigations if it's along a route? If you're closing virtually all of the ticket offices and you're going to get three quarters of a million responses, that means you've got to think again just anyway. You've got to stop what you're doing because nobody's supporting it. They're not getting three quarters of a million responses saying, please close my ticket office. So they've got to stop and take a breath. These watchdogs are completely overwhelmed, and they said, do not do this closure program in this way. Go in swathes if you've got to do it, but we cannot staff or resource it. That's why they're having to extend. So the whole process is flawed, and I think... It needs to be halted. Um, I, I don't disagree with my colleagues, but I'm going to be more optimistic. Um, I don't think that the groundswell of opposition was anticipated, and I think it's turned it into a far more political issue um, than they'd initially envisaged. So 
I do think that the government could probably do themselves a favour and listen to what people are saying. Um, I think that would be that would help. They could help themselves a lot by if if the, if they did pay attention to um, to the committee and to may, maybe to organisations like ours as well. Um, I'm sure they've been. Uh, inundated I'm sure MPs on a constituency level have received a lot of correspondence about it so yeah I think that um, the government could I'm not, I haven't I haven't given up hope okay. um, apologies chair the very yes no questions <laughs> thank you um, I've just got one quick uh, question of clarification from me because it's something I want to put to the, the uh, train operators uh, in their session later and the, your point about them wanting to phase out ticket mm. vending machines. Mm. Um, is it, you said there were the contracts for maintenance were being phased out and that was a reason why you think they're, that they're not going to be here for much longer. But just to clarify, is that for the existing machines? Because I'm aware of lots of new types of ticket vending machines that are coming on stream. Uh, for example, Northern at Leeds yeah. have got an interactive uh, one. But I just wanted to clarify what there, your point There will is. be new machines and there will be updates, but the long term, I think they just find it to be an overhead and it will go the same way as air travel. So if you want... Ryanair, it's almost like you've got a job with them when you try and uh, book a flight or EasyJet. That's their future of, uh, view of the railway, that you, the less infrastructure you have, the better, because it's cheaper. I will be putting that point to them uh, later on. Uh, but for now, can I thank you all very much indeed for your time this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to our second panel. Uh, if I could ask you to introduce yourself and your organisation, please. I'll start with you, Stephanie. Thank you. My name is Stephanie, <coughs> sorry, Stephanie Tobin. I'm the Director of Strategy, Policy and Reform at the Office of Rail and Road. Thank you. Um, Anthony Smith, Chief Executive of Transport Focus, the independent voice for Britain's transport users. Thank you. Uh, and again, thank you for giving us uh, your time this morning. Um, Anthony, if I could start with you, could, just to set out... Uh, for colleagues and indeed uh, the public who are watching, what the role of Transport Focus and London Travel Watch is in this consultation process? We have a very prescribed role in this process, which is set out by the Ticketing and Settlement Agreement, which is something you do not want to read before you go to bed. It's a vast, thick document that was set up at privatisation, which governs the relationships on ticket retail and retailing generally between the train companies and the rail delivery group. Um, it was put in place at privatisation, it's existed through all successive governments since then, and that sets out the process by which um, changes are made to ticket office um, arrangements. So just to be very clear, it's nothing to do, it's not our process, the process is owned by the rail, del rail delivery group and the train operating companies. It requires train companies to put up notices at stations, explaining any potential new arrangements and giving, giving passengers the opportunity to contact us and London Travel Watch. We then analyse the proposals and give a response to the train company on each individual station. It is not a generic consultation about change. It is 860 individual consultations about changes at particular stations. We then have to give a binary answer. Yes, we agree. No, we don't. There's no sort of middle road on this one. It has to be yes or no. And the ticking settlement agreement sets out the terms of reference for looking at the proposals. Train companies can make a change if, and it's very important, this, the, these two sentences, the change would represent an improvement on current arrangements, rate quality of service and or cost effectiveness. And members of the public would continue to enjoy widespread and easy access to the purchase of rail products notwithstanding the change. So, Chair, that's our, that's our role in a nutshell. Thank you. And can I just uh, check that uh, are you comfortable that this formal role that you have in this consultation uh, doesn't involve a conflict of interest with your broader role as the, the voice of the passenger uh, and one that is well-respected? 
Um, I, I th- we, have the, we have the role that we've been cast into, and as I say, it has survived successive governments. And yes, we are comfortable. We will do a professional, responsible job on behalf of passengers in this respect, and we will make sure that we have listened very carefully to the numerous representations that have been made. So it, it puts in place an opportunity for consultation. I don't necessarily agree with um, some of the previous comments made about the, the done deal of the consultation. This is a process. And we do have a role. We haven't come to a conclusion yet because we're still analysing the responses because the the end date is not not quite upon us. So, yes, it's um, it's quite a challenge to be honest, given the scale of this. This process has been used in the past either for individual stations, or we've had five train companies in the past where there's been um, changes across their ticket office estate, but never anything quite on this scale. But um, we're coping at the moment. Just to check, for, in terms of analysing all the responses, and some coll- colleagues will want to ask for some further questions about this, but do you have a fixed date by which you have to uh, make a judgment, or is it as long as it takes? No, it's, um, the, the timescales are set out um, by the train companies, essentially, and after the readjustment to the timescales, we have to respond by the 31st of October to each, each train company. Um, we can't do a nil response. A nil response is deemed to be acceptance, so we have to say yes or no. Therefore, we're, we're cast in this role. We will play our part. Thank you. Uh, and Stephanie, if I could ask you just to summarise the ORR's uh, role in this process. Yes, um, we have no formal role under the Ticketing and Settlement Agreement. Um, we do have an ongoing and very fundamental role in ensuring the accessibility of the railway, and that is through the licence conditions um, where we grant the licence to operators. They're required to produce an accessible travel policy, and you heard Katie allude to that earlier. Um, we in, 19, sorry, in 2019, we produced through public consultation guidance on that accessible travel policy and the operators provide their policies in accordance with that guidance. What's particularly relevant here is that if the operators change staffing or processes that affect accessibility, then if it's a material change, we have to re-approve that guidance. So what we're doing now, very briefly, is just having active and early engagement with the operators. We want them to understand those responsibilities, to think very carefully about what they're proposing and to ensure that they're taking everything into account through that process. Thank you. Um, And if I can pick up on a a point that was made by the previous panel, that uh, the the, the TSA uh, was primarily designed for individual uh, proposals to close uh, uh, or reform a ticket office, but you, as you said, you are doing. It's it was eight hundred and eight hundred and sixty eight hundred and sixty individual mm. ones, and people are viewing this as being all lumped together. Mm. Do you think this process is a, an appropriate one uh, to look at this wide scale change uh, in the um, industry? I don't think the ticketing settlement agreement was ever designed for something of this magnitude, to be honest. I can't imagine that it was. It's worked quite well in the past with um, individual stations or operators. We took a full part in the Scottish consultation in 2021, um, dealt with all the responses there. The, the, the decision is now sitting on the desk of the Scottish Government as to whether to proceed or not. Um, but we are where we are. The ticketing settlement agreement is being followed in this respect. And as I say, we can't walk away. We can't not participate. We have to give a response. And we heard from the previous panel of witnesses considerable concerns about the nature of the consultations that the individual uh, train operators have run, the the problems with uh, accessibility, uh, vague terms. Uh, I I recall the one that affects my local station was there will be a mobile uh, t- uh, mm. service unit without any clarification as to whether that was once a day, once a week, once a month or, or, or whatever. Uh, do you think the consultation was designed well and, and what role did you have in, uh, in framing it? Um, we, the, the, the consultation design is very much that of the individual train companies. Um, we liaised with the train companies beforehand to make sure that they had the correct contact details for us and London Travel Watch on the posters and websites. But the decision on how much information and what to publish was very much um, in the gift of the train companies. We tried to make it as easy as possible for people to contact us, so we accepted responses by email, free post, we created a web form, then anybody who wanted to ring us and request any form of assistance was able to do that. 
And initially we set up email addresses for each train company because that's, that's how the consultation was being structured. But then eventually we started to get quite a lot of generic general responses saying we don't like any of this. There was no discussion about the overall policy proposal, so we also set up a kind of general response form as well. Um, we argued from the start that the train companies had to make the proposals available in as many different formats as was applicable. We went through train company websites after the, the, the beginning of the process on the 5th of July to check all the details and reported on some of the gaps that we found there. And we pushed for the equality impact assessments to be made public as soon as possible. And we surveyed, what we've also done is surveyed um, people who have responded to us just to check that they form a kind of representative sample of the travelling public so there wasn't a bias towards commuters or disabled passengers or whatever and from our initial assessment it looks like a pretty good cross-section of the British travelling rail travelling public have actually responded. Thank you. Um, Paul, if we could turn, uh, turn to you next. Thanks Chair. Um, I just want to pick up on specific on a couple of points there that, that you've raised. I mean if, if I pick the numbers up right, um, there's 860 stations to be evaluated all at individual levels. Yes. You said you have to do it by the end of October. Mm. That's about six weeks. Mm. That's about 30 stations a day. Mm. Have you got the resources to deliver that? Yes, we have. I think two things that make it possible, one of which is whilst 860 stations sounds, sounds like a scary amount, some of the, the proposals are relatively generic with some of the train companies, so they're fairly similar at individual stations. We needed to make sure that the the responses that we've had, and at the beginning of the month, we'd ha Transport Focus has had about half a million responses. London Travel Watch has had about 180,000. We're still checking through the postal ones, which take a little bit longer to read. So I suspect we will reach three quarters of a million by the end of the, by the time of the end of the tally. Quite a lot of those responses are relatively um, similar in terms of they have been generated um, through organised campaigns, either by some of the unions or some um, online pressure, online um, petition platforms. And so those, those responses are much easier in a sense to analyse. What we're making sure is that we can pull out any response which picks up individual, individual responses about individual stations and making sure that we can, we can do all that. We're using an outsourced um, contact provider to do all the initial response. These people we've worked with for years, they handle all our frontline complaint sounding, they know the rail industry well, they know us well. So we've got a good process um, um, in place, but I wouldn't say it's <coughs> easy and it has, yes, we haven't done much else for the last three months, let's put it like that. But at the end of the day, I, as sitting here now, I think we will be able to play a full and professional part in the, in the responses by the 31st of October. Okay, and you, you said that um, you know, your specific role in the consultation process is as you defined it, um, but is there also a, a role just with the transport focus hat on to be then saying, okay, but overall, this is our view of what um, you know the, of the assessment as a whole in terms of you know w whether the consultation has been done well, you know what the outcomes or recommendations are. Do you have a separate uh, situation that's appropriate for you to comment into there? Yes, we, we think it is. I think on the 31st of October we will publish two things and we will publish absolutely everything. So on the 31st, for the, on the 31st of October there will be 18 letters, sorry, 12 letters published to the train companies concerned, setting out all of our comments. Um, and we will also, on top of that, publish a general comment about the process and about the types of issues that we've seen, because responding to the fact that quite a lot of people came back to us and said, we're worried about this across the country, we're worried about how the train company proposals fit together, we're worried about how the train company proposals fit with Network Rail and their role at major stations. British Transport Police have expressed some concerns about some of this, which we have also been in discussion with them about. So we will publish two things. We'll publish a generic sort of watchdog um, response, and then we will publish the, the, exactly what we have to do and prescribe to do by, in our role. Okay, and you, you, you talked about um, you know, the, the, trying to get a, a cross-section of responses mm. in terms of, of sorry, a cross-section of inputs that then um, you, you feel represents people across <laughs> society. Um, do, does your evaluation, though, um, take cognizant of the fact that you're vulnerable or you're disabled people, their impact is disproportionately high in terms of where it is. I don't know, I don't know whether, what the proportionate 
submissions are, but their, the impact on them of changes and the mm. need to get to an accessible train service um, is disproportionate. So would that be reflected in the way that you would consider your um, conclusions? Yes, it would. We've, set, we've published criteria right at the beginning of this process, setting out how we would judge the, um, the proposals and how we would take account of the um, responses that we've received. Um, I, if I may, Chair, could I circulate this just so that members have this in, in detail? Thank you very much. Um, it says that would passenger, when would the criteria we'll use is that passengers can easily buy the right ticket for the journey they want to make. Passengers requiring assistance to travel receive that assistance in a timely and reliable manner. Passengers can get information they require to plan and make a journey. Passengers feel safe at a station. Passengers are not penalised if they cannot buy the ticket they require from the station. And passengers can continue to use the facilities, toilets, waiting rooms or whatever at the station. That very much mirrors actually the criteria which the Secretary of State would apply if, um, if train companies appeal um, an objection from us. So we've got very clear criteria and just so the committee is assured what we're doing now is we're talking in detail to the train companies about the proposals and about the emerging conclusions that we're seeing from all the responses from the public we've sent very extremely detailed clarification letters to the train companies which we're discussing at the moment seeking to tease out a lot of the detail and um, we are therefore engaged in quite a sort of um, detailed discussion at the moment. So we will have a very full picture by the end of this as to exactly what is being proposed. And how do you think the um, Secretary of State will you know, get the understanding to make the, to have the right basis for his decisions? Is, is, that, is the structure there in terms of your report? I think our responses will be very full and will be very comprehensive. And I think the Secretary of State, in addition to, uh, if, if it does come to that, if train companies do decide to trigger an appeal, in a sense, to the Secretary of State on individual stations or groups of stations, the Secretary of State will have from us a very detailed, comprehensive, well-documented passenger view. Okay, just one, one, one final point, Chair, just before we move, move on from this. Um, I know that, um, I read that when TfL closed the, some of the underground stations, London Travel what said that closures were done before all the company and elements were put in place. Do you believe that the train operating companies have, have learned from this and that they will make sure that if there's things that they've said they're going to do, they're actually done before rather than after? Um, any changes that are there or would that be part of your e evaluation and recommendations? Without prejudging any individual responses, I think it's quite clear that we'll be saying to the train companies that the mitigation factors have to be in place before the changes come in, because otherwise the, the, the car, you're getting the cart and the horse slightly the wrong way around. And I think there is a case, and we may well argue this in either in particular cases or generally, that there's an argument for piloting this and seeing what the effect is and then having a formal review after a period of time, because members' questions before about the potential for people not to travel Frankly, we won't know until it happens, and um, you can model it all you like, I suspect, but you know, we'll have to find out by seeing what happens in reality. And of course, indivi every individual that turns up at a rail station is slightly different. Every rail station is slightly different. How people interact is, is a very particular thing. And so I think we might be arguing for a review period after 12 months to see how the changes have gone. And I think it is worth saying, Chair, if I may, that we're not in any way um, opposed to the principle of redeploying staff out of ticket offices onto a more visible role onto stations. If done properly, that could be a benefit to very many passengers who are seeking assistance. Our research over the years has always shown people want visible staff. They want to be able to see a member of staff. That's what gives reassurance, even if they don't need to ask them or seek help. And so the principle, I think, is a positive about redeployment, but it's got to be done well, and it's got to meet a lot of it. You know, it's got to, it's got to pass quite a high hurdle. And just to say one final point, Chair, that just the points that were raised earlier were concerns around not necessarily the change that's going to go on, but the legislative underpinning of that new world, and mm. making sure that it actually isn't just a way to, you know demand and remove our, our, our personnel from the, the, the stations. Does that 
your responses pick up that nuance as well? Yes, I think we'll be making that in our general response, saying that for all its faults, that this process at least does provide almost like a kind of tripwire of consultation on staffing changes. Once staff are moved out of the ticket office and there ceases to be this so-called Schedule 17 <coughs> protection, it is simpler, more easier, arguably, to make changes. And I think having some sort of future consultation mechanism about changes would be desirable. I don't think you can say there's never going to be changes because the world changes, stations changes, passenger numbers ebb and flow. There has to be changes in future. But I think there, it would be really reassuring that there would be some consultation mechanism in future if this level of change went ahead. Some checks and balances, certainly. Thank you, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you want to add to that, Stephanie? I know we'll come to questions for yourself yeah. separately. No, absolutely. Yeah. Just, just one point. Um, there is already the check and balance on the accessible travel policy. Mm -hmm. So in the future, if there was a change in staffing and it was material change, we would need to re-approve the accessible travel policy and we would consult with Transport Focus, with London Travel Watch and also with DIPTAC. It's not this sort of consultation, but it is already a, an element of a safety net and, and we could think about how that could work in future. And is that a statutory provision? It's in um, our guidance and the licence holders are required to comply with the guidance for us to approve um, their accessible travel policy. So it's not written in a statutory instrument or written in an act, but it is in our guidance. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Carl, you wanted a supplementary? Uh, thank you, Chair. It's sort of partly been covered and, and Anthony, you gave a pragmatic view. Um, but my question I'm going to aim, aim at Stephanie. Um, do you honestly believe that these changes brought in, in, in you know, completely brought in would generate a better railway system for the vast majority of current passengers? Well, we're obviously not proposing these changes, but I think what is important to recognise here is there is not a consistent process today across the network. You have partially staffed stations, you have unstaffed stations, you have mobile assistance teams. So you have a variety of ways that operators are providing assistance. What this is is a significant potential expansion of that. And, and I fully understand that people who are used to turning up to the station and having a ticket office and member of staff will not think that's a step forward. Use an example of supermarkets. And, you know, lots of people still do go to supermarkets and yes. some people get deliveries. But if you go to a supermarket, many supermarkets have automatic yes. tills you go through. But there are vast swathes of the population who do not use those tills, and I'm one of them, yes. who will go to a person, whether that's because we want to speak to somebody, whether that's because we want to pay in cash, whatever we might do. And that is the same for stations. Now, you're involved in the rail industry, as are many others. Do you think those people are going to be well served by these changes being brought in in total? I think in any scenario there will be a lot of people who will not like this who will not adapt well to this without support, and that's really what these mitigations... Oh, will the rail industry lose their custom, therefore? I can't answer that, obviously, but that is a your, huge in question. In your humble opinion, do you think that some people will not use the rail system? I think it will take time to adjust. I think there will be a significant period of adjustment. And I know, if you like, from my own immediate family, they don't like exactly what you're talking about. They don't like supermarkets. They don't like these sort of ticket machines. Um, and they do need support, but then as time goes on, they do adjust. That's a personal experience, but mm. you, you need to think about that mm. as a bigger picture. Nobody likes change, and it's the management exactly. of change. Yeah, we understand that. I don't know if Anthony, you want to add anything? Or I think the, the impact is very, very hard to judge because some people clearly at the moment turn up for a ticket office because <coughs> it's, just, it's nice and easy. And you know, they can't be bothered with digital and fiddling around with apps. If, if that option is removed, they, may, they may, may well just move to digital and get on with it. There's a group of people who I think will find it quite difficult and will, it will need some adjustment and some support. And there's probably a group of people who think, oh, I just can't be bothered. It's just too complicated. Ticket machines are interesting because if you know what you want, they're great. If I want an off-peak return to Milton Keynes with my senior rail card, duh, 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 easy. If I want to go to Milton Keynes in the peak, come back in the off-peak using my Oyster 60 Plus photo card, oh blimey, I need a bit of help. Already, but yeah, I know you. <laughs> I need a bit of help. Uh, I would go. And, I, I, you know, I wouldn't dream of trying to use a ticket machine for that. I'd go and ask a member of staff. So, does it, I think there's a great group of people in the middle of this who will need reassurance, will need visible help in 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 the transition process. You both actually change. Someone who, maybe not with a senior citizen rail card yet, but who sometimes has to do these complex journeys, I, I can understand <laughs> the, uh, the complexity. Uh, Jack. Thank you, Chair. And most of my questions are to Stephanie. Uh, was OR consulted in advance by DFT or any of the operators? 
We were not consulted, no. We were informed around about a year ago by a senior industry representative that the industry wanted to make changes to retailing, to ticket offices and, and to save costs, but there was no period of consultation. We did not see any of the consultations in advance, no operator <coughs> approached us in advance, so literally we knew the date, very close to the date that everything was announced, but that, would, that was really it. Right, OK. In terms of the overall impact, <coughs> have you done any analysis on what is the impact of these proposals, particularly on people with uh, disabilities and uh, access issues? We have. Um, I have asked my team to look at the various proposals. Um, a lot of what you've heard here already around the inconsistencies that different operators are putting forward. We can see this obvious variation in what's being proposed. Mm. Um, we obviously have a lot of research on um, disabled passengers' use of booked assistance, we have less research on turn up and go assistance, so we haven't had any discussions on any of this with any passenger groups. Mm -hmm. Are you very concerned about the impact that is obviously going to be particularly felt by those with a disability? The, the question now really is what mitigations would the operators put forward? So, for example, I've been very close to, in the past, to GTR moving to using mobile assistance teams. Um, that took us probably around about four months. Um, to assess what they were doing, to interrogate the processes, to collect data, to look at how that was all working in practice before we were saying, OK, we can accept that, that is working for passengers. And that was a number of years ago. And I think they operate mobile assistance teams at around 50 stations now. I've not had cause to go back and look at that. So there is this period of transition assessment, potentially making changes, but the mitigations are absolutely key here. We haven't seen those yet, and when Transport Focus engage with the operators, they will have a better feel for what those look like. Mm -hmm. I know you've mentioned about um, the accessible travel policy you just touched on that could result in a you know, further consultation if future changes were made, but do you think that is robust enough? Do you think other uh, regulatory uh, reforms need to be made to put additional uh, mechanisms in place so that if future staffing changes were made that there would be proper formal consultation processes uh, that operators would have to go through? It's, it's definitely not equivalent to this process right. because it does not involve that element of public consultation. So I would imagine very people, many people here will not think that is sufficient, but certainly we are willing to look at what else could be done in that area if that was seen as a tool that could facilitate some of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, <coughs> how the alternative arrangements might work, uh, what further things would OOR want to see? Well, the question is, are the current arrangements, if you're just talking about staffing, mm -hmm. um, it would certainly assist us in terms of um, the ATPs to go through the process that we've got already decided, but it's really up to, to government and, and to the ministers to whether or not public consultation is necessary um, for all of these changes that could happen in the future. And we are sort of speculating there. But is there a backstop position required? And where or what would that backstop be? We're certainly happy to engage in discussions on that. Sure. Uh, Gavin. Um, thanks so much, Chair. Um, Stephanie, you just mentioned a short while ago the um, importance of that, the ATP yeah. policy and obviously the licence holders, I think you described the obligations um, under, under it in terms of following its guidance. And obviously if, if we were to look at the, the review from last year, some of it was concerning, some of it was deeply concerning, um, <clears throat> and that was a year ago. So obviously with our, our looking at the proposed changes, uh, why did the OR, ORR have to write to the talks back in July highlighting relevant regulatory mm -hmm. considerations and asking them to review their um, proposal, uh, proposals against ATP? So, as, as I said at the start, we do not have a formal role here, but we felt it was incumbent upon us to take an active and early role in trying to ensure that all of these requirements were being thought of in the development of the consultation. So it was more a sort of belt and braces approach. We also wanted to support the sector in asking questions and understanding some of these things. Some I genuinely don't understand some of the proposals that have been put forward, and I don't think there are yet answers to some of the proposals. So already we are starting to think, well, how would that work? That, that wouldn't fit 
with what we think should be done under the accessible travel policy. I can't understand how a team could turn up at a prescribed time at a station once a week. I can't understand how that would facilitate turn up and go assistance. So we have multiple questions on that, but we felt it was early, sorry, important to start to help the operators understand that early. Well, you, you have a number of concerns with, the, with many of the proposals. You've outlined one, but could you maybe outline some other concerns? <clears throat> yep, I think you've probably heard them from a number of people, but most um, obviously <clears throat> there is the, the use of mobile teams, whether that is the same as is the current situation, which is more passenger summoning assistance, or whether people are saying we will appear at a certain time, at a certain place, or on a certain frequency, mm. which is completely different to what we have now. I think there is a question over passengers with visual impairments and how they, how they find staff, um, whether staff can spot them, how they perhaps use, um, how they perhaps identify that they need assistance to the guard on the train. We've not talked about guards today, we talk a lot about station staff, but many trains are fully staffed, and to have that staff assisting the passenger is almost equivalent to having station staff. So that's why things need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we are concerned about the induction loop situation and also about, um, I have heard that guide dogs are trained through command to find the ticket office. So there's many unknown questions. I would narrow it down, if you like, very briefly, where I think the most risk um, will come into play will be for unstaffed stations um, <coughs> where people wish to turn up and go and how that assistance will be provided. The risk is there now. It is managed to a certain extent, but if that expands, there needs to be different and more robust processes. To summarise your <coughs> position is you're very concerned that accessibility wasn't been taken into account at that point? At this point, we cannot answer some of those questions, and I'm not sure that Transport Focus can answer them yet, hence they are communicating with the operators to gather more information. But those were our immediate... We, it's not obvious to us how this would operate. And have you received responses from all the talks? We have. We, we asked for very high level information and I think it struck us that they were not fully uh, clear on some of these things yet, so we had to go back for further information. We don't want to duplicate the transport focus mm. process here. I think that would be a waste of time. Mm. I think we have got to a point where we are concerned and we're working with the transport focus to understand and to, to look at really what you've been asking, which effectively covers the majority of these issues. So we have to keep track of this process. That's fair enough. And you mentioned earlier that this is guidance and it's not mm -hmm. statutory powers. But what powers um, do the OR have if you consider the ATP guidance isn't being followed by an operator? So, so the ATP guidance effectively is how the operator complies with their licence. Mm -hmm. um, it contains in it things they must do and things that they may wish to consider. On the things they must do, we could effectively take action against operators if they did not then comply. Um, we spend a lot of time working with operators trying to ensure they comply, um, to explain to them what they need to do, to go through um, potentially improvement plans if they're not doing things appropriately, to do deep dives into the information. So we try and stop issues at an early stage rather than going to that formal enforcement action, but that is an option. And moving forward, would you like, would you assume that the talks will work with you to, um, to improve um, their compliance? with the ATP? So I do. I think the industry has moved forward on accessibility. I know there is a lot of negativity um, from people who do have poor experiences. If I just give you two examples, I mean, since 2019, since we um, brought in that guidance, um, the period for booked assistance has moved from 24 hours in advance of travel to two hours in advance of travel. 24 hours is almost incredible now to think that you had to plan your travel a day ahead. It has moved to two hours because of that guidance. Um, we have improved the content and the frequency of staff training. Um, we assessed all of the training. We have set out outcomes for training. We required induction training, which covered around 30,000 staff. And we now require training every two years. So it's two examples of where the industry has worked with us. Um, to move forward on those two issues. But as you can see, and as you've heard, there remain a number of issues to tackle here. Uh, I suppose to, to both of you, do you think that compliance with ATP will improve um, or deteriorate with, if these changes go ahead? <clears throat> I think that for me, at this stage, it's very difficult to tell because I have not seen the mitigations that are proposed, but we would not approve an ATP unless it complied. And I'll let Anthony comment. <laughs> 
I think yes, we're still analysing the responses, so I can't prejudge. But the you know the main themes of objection that we've been seeing through the um, through the responses, no surprise, have a lot to do with accessibility and this issue about you know a fixed point of where do you find somebody, how, and, you know how do you replicate the ticket office for all its all its faults, arguably in terms of where it's located. Um, the ability to purchase the range of tickets, the, the retail capacity of the ticket vending machines, because if you've got six people in a queue at a ticket office, can that be replicated um, at the number of ticket vending machines which are proposed? A very important point, that thing about information advice that was mentioned by previous witnesses, that ticket officers perform a range of functions. They sell tickets, people, people ask the staff for information advice, and they provide a general sort of security um, sense. There's a light on at the end of the night in the ticket office. Um, station facilities being open, toilets, waiting rooms, then of course general security issues. So, that, whatever whatever is comes about as part of this process, will have to find effect in the the, um, the ATPs of the future. From a transport uh, focus point of view, do you think that the changes should be, uh, if they were to, if the article head should be postponed? Um, until ticket machines, all ticket machines can offer all forms of tickets to ensure that everyone's got the best um, or most economic form of travel? I think the, we would probably be proposing that you, you've got to upgrade the ticket machines to replicate. If, if it's the case that the ticket office is either closing or the ticket office is being reduced in hours very significantly, I think the ticket vending machine has got to be able to replicate pretty much what the ticket office can do at the moment. So I think we would argue that you would want to delay until you've got that capacity in place. Otherwise, people are being disadvantaged. Um, you know, you, there's certain types of ticket you can only get at the moment from a ticket office. You have to be able to get them from a ticket vending machine. And how big a risk do you think that um, in response to these new arrangements, again, if they are to go ahead as, as um, planned, that some passengers simply decide not to travel or have to travel from a different station? How big a, an issue do you think that may be? Uh, I think it's very hard to judge at the moment in advance of actually seeing the final proposals. I mean, I'd be able to answer that and answer that question for the committee in a much better way in about um, six weeks' time. Well, well, now how could those kinds of how could those impacts be identified? How would that be tracked? I think through ticket sales Just data, ticket sales. it would be quite, you know, there's, the industry's now got a, a very good track on ticket sales data, and I think they would be able to plot what's predicted, what's actual, how ticket, vend how, how ticket buying habits have changed, how more has shifted online, how now more is being done through TVMs, and also perhaps how more is being done on sales on trains, where that is possible, because, of course, some trains have got, still got guards on who can sell you a ticket. Okay, thanks so much. A very artful yeah. answer on the compliance improvement or deterioration question from both. But thanks, Chair. Thank you, Graham. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, in, uh, in your opening remarks, um, Mr Smith, you mentioned that you'd called upon the Department for Transport to um, publish the results of their discussions with the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. But I understand both the ORR and Transport Focus have separately met with the Equality and Human Rights Commission. What can you tell us uh, about the discussions that you've had? Um, we have very detailed discussions with the Commission about the process of the consultation and also about the potential impact of some of the changes. And the Commission had quite serious concerns about both both elements of that. We were able to allay quite a lot of their concerns about the potential um, proposals because we're in discussion with the train companies about those and therefore we're able to reflect and take into account all of the comments that we've received. Um, the comments about the consultation itself and the mechanisms, well, um, there, are some, there have been some threats of some legal challenges. There have been some quite you know, vociferous um, complaints about the process and the way it's been done. Whether or not it's sufficient to trigger legal action in the future, I don't know. But we, we engaged in detail with them. So, uh, earlier, uh, um, Stephanie uh, uh, referred to the accessible tra um, travel policies that the, tra the rail operators, the train operating companies, um, are required to sign up to under the terms of their licence. But if it isn't possible to deliver that, surely there must be a breach of equalities and um, human rights uh, um, provisions. Is that a matter for the Commission to decide? 
if, if, I can, of closures. if I can briefly answer that, so we, we make it very clear to the operators that they have obligations under the Equality Act, as do we, um, and they have an accessible travel policy. Just because they comply with the accessible travel policy or don't comply, if, if that was the case, they still have obligations under the Equality Act. So when they're not equivalent, they need to mm. think about both. It's very important. And, and, you, you, and you pointed that out? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, did, did you hear the earlier panel, the, the first panel? Mm. I, I thought it was it was really quite an important point about the, the importance of Schedule 17, because both... Um, uh, Katie Pennick and Mick Lynch from the RMT said that without Schedule 17, once the ticket offices are closed, there'd be no mandatory or statutory obligation on operators <coughs> to provide staffing or, or indeed assistance. Um, that's once the ticket offices are closed. So this is kind of the last redoubt I I in some regards. Uh, and uh, um, Mr Lynch also said the train operating companies have already announced 2,300 station staff uh, job losses. Uh, you know, they're going to do go ahead with that. That's about a quarter uh, of all station staff employed by the train operating companies. So, we, uh, Mr Smith, you were going through these. You told my colleague at a rate of knots, 30 ticket offices a day are making an assessment, yes or no. Mm. Uh, are you taking that into account? Uh, you know, because it seems to be, it's a bit of a fait accompli. A quarter of the staff are already going, so there must be some impact of that in terms of um, the availability of staff, whether they're in the ticket office or roving commissioners. Um, I, I'm, I'm not party to the kind of detail of the industrial relations discussions between the industry and the union, so I can't comment on that. I, I, I just don't know about that. But that will... It, that will not sway how we approach this. We'll look at it from the passenger point of view. And it, it, I think it's very important that that's what we do in this process, that we, we have a, we're, we're the only party in the process that, has a, that is only charged with looking at this from the passenger's point of view. And I think your point about the future is a good one. And I think the rail industry would be very well advised to say that this, if some of these proposals go ahead, that in future there is a consultation mechanism on changes in staffing that will give some comfort to people because otherwise we're kind of in very open territory as you said well well I'm, I'm afraid that wasn't the view of the previous panel they thought that if this went ahead there was no um, mandatory or statutory basis to resist mm. train operating companies completely de-staffing uh, uh, their, their, their platforms and so on but that, that was their view yeah. uh, and you know they pointed to schedule 17 can I ask about independence of, uh, yes. of the, uh, of, the uh, uh, of, of transport force because you gave evidence in March and I, I asked you a little bit about it then mm. and Mr Montgomery was on another panel I think and I asked him about the um, the ticket office closures uh, the uh, almost a thousand he said there weren't any plans um, well, maybe there wasn't a plan to close a thousand, but they closed an eight hundred and sixty. Mm. Because I, I'm, 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 I'm sure, I'm sure it was all done in good faith. But c can I just ask you about the independence of mm. of, um, of transport focus? Because is it yourself and, and the other board members are actually appointed by the Secretary of State? I think I asked you this in, in uh, March as mm. well. It, it, would it, would, would is there any suggestion that? That there would be um, any influence on the independence of your outcome in terms of assessing the uh, whether it's yes or no to the closure because of the nature of your appointments. Um, I'm, I'm the chief executive. I'm not appointed by the Secretary of State. I'm appointed by the Board of Transport Focus. and but The Board are all appointed by the Secretary of State. They are. They? And you know, I don't disguise the fact that we receive most of our funding from the department. But the department have been absolutely clear throughout this whole process that we it's a key part of the consultation that we play an active independent professional responsible role they've been at pains to say that i've sat in front of the transport um minister hugh merriman who has said that to us they are very very keen that we play a full role on behalf of passengers so i can absolutely assure you that this will be done in an independent and responsible way and if if it wasn't i wouldn't be sitting here in front of you because i'd be ashamed well i'm grateful thank you for that mm. answer thank you thanks chair uh, thank you, Graham. I've just got one last question. I'm not uh, asking you to prejudge the conclusions uh, that you'll reach, but when you do report on the uh, 31st of October, 
What's your best guess for the time scale thereafter? What, you know, how likely are we to see this uh, process move forward or kicked into the long grass or mm. whatever you think the outcome might be? Um, Is that an impossible question? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> There's three, three potential options when we give our responses. Um, if we say yes, um, in particular cases, then the train companies can move forward on this and they will take their assess- accessible travel policies to the o- office of the road. They then have to seek permission from the department to actually formally go ahead with the proposals if, if they're going ahead. If we object, they've got, the train company has three choices. They can withdraw the proposal, go back to square one, they can they can talk to us about getting the objection withdrawn, i.e. by offering mitigations. But that gets you into quite difficult territory because you get to a point where the mitigated proposal is so different from the original proposal that was kind of being consulted on. It's a bit apples and pears, and so we have to be a bit careful about that. Or they can refer this to the Secretary of State for adjudication in individual cases, and the Secretary of State has a kind of appellant right in that respect. So um, we will fulfil our part in this. The responses will be in and published by the 31st of October. And then it's very much down to the train companies as to guiding what happens next and the timetable next. And let's just say the majority of your conclusions on the individual stations are we're not happy, we need to talk to the the talks for them to potentially revise them. And you've got several hundred of these to do. What's the likely time that that's going to take? Um, I think then we're into quite difficult territory, and I wouldn't put a date on it, because they would be extremely difficult. Data detailed discussions at individual station level, and um, I think it would be weeks and weeks before we'd be able to get to any conclusions. I hope we don't get to that point, but um, it would be weeks and weeks. Thank you both very much indeed for your time, and uh, we wish you well uh, in your Herculean task of going through all the responses. (laughs) Thank you. Um, before we uh, introduce our third panel, uh, Carl, you wish to declare an interest? I do wish to declare an interest in the fact that I know David Horn quite well, I think it's reasonable to say, isn't it, David? Yeah. Thank you. Um, welcome to our third and final uh, panel today. Could I ask each of the witnesses to give their name and organisation, please? Start with uh, Mr. Allen. Uh, yep. Good morning, Richard Allen, Managing Director of Children Railways. Thank you. Good morning, David Horn, Managing Director of LNER. Good morning, Andy Mellers, Managing Director of Anti West Coast. And good morning, I'm Simon Moorhead. I'm the Chief Information Officer at Rail Delivery Group. Uh, thank you, um, and thank you for your time uh, this morning. Um, let me start with the, uh, the, the sort of basic question uh, that we're considering today. Why is it that you wish to close the vast majority of ticket offices? Mr. Allen. So we've heard today uh, some examples of what Chilton operates at stations like Bister Village, Oxford Parkway and Aylesbury, which is an open plan environment out behind the glass. Our proposal is to extend that principle at the rest of our staff stations. We're talking about 20 stations in total. So keeping the same hours of staffing at the moment, but taking colleagues out behind the glass into a multi-skilled, multi-purpose role that's flexible, available, uh, and doing that in the same principles we already have at several stations, which we've operated successfully for several years. Mr Horn? Yeah, I do think it's really important that we look to modernise our railway to serve the needs of current and future customers. I actually started my career working in ticket offices about 30 years ago, and at that time everybody did buy their ticket 
through ticket offices uh, because the internet didn't exist. One thing also at that time was very few people had accessibility requirements on the railway. I don't think the railway was as accessible as it is today. So what we're seeing today is, of course, many more people buying their tickets online and through ticket vending machines. And we're also seeing many more people have accessibility requirements and need for assistance from staff when they travel by train. So this is about shifting how staff are utilised on the railway so that instead of being underutilised in ticket offices, we're able to bring them out from behind the glass, uh, closer to the customer, to help those customers whether they have accessibility needs or not. I echo what colleagues have already said in terms of the shift in customer behaviour, in terms of buying habits, not just since uh, the railways were privatised and the ticket and settlement agreement was put in place 30 years ago, but also how that trend has been exacerbated uh, since, the, uh, since the pandemic. This is actually about making sure that we've got greater visibility of our staff, better support for customers, uh, creating that more visible and, and reassuring presence. I think certainly echoing the point that uh, we are looking to put our staff where our customers need them and so making sure they are Sorry. don't worry thank you making making sure they're in place to be able to support customers when they need their help but secondly it is also representing a generational shift in the way our customers buy their tickets and we're seeing that through the data that we get every day in terms of more and more people shifting to digital and more and more people shifting to tap in tap out for many many more of our services I think the final thing that hasn't quite come up yet is we have to have regard to the cost of running the industry and the support that the government currently gives to the rail industry the government is currently giving £10 million a day to be able to subsidise the, the railway. We want to get back to a place where we attract more people onto rail and make sure that we can uh, 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 have the fair payer um, properly uh, reflecting the cost of rail. Thank you. I understand the, the rationale for making these sort of changes. You know, nothing stays static in, in life, and whether it's banks or supermarkets, they all innovate new ways. But I'm, I'm keen to know why right now and why in such a comprehensive way, given that there are other reforms happening in the rail industry, the move to GBR, uh, ticketing reform, uh, <coughs> why does it all have to be done at once in every operator when perhaps it would be more sensible to do it on an organic uh, basis uh, individually with each operator? Mr. Allen. So I think from my perspective, then, the pandemic has delayed change. So the stations we talked about earlier were uh, adapted or built uh, several years ago, and really we lost two or three years of development in COVID. So we're trying to catch up, and certainly I'm keen to improve that experience to change the facilities for customers, but also for colleagues. Some of our stations are a bit tired. They need some investment, and as part of this, we'd like to invest in the physical space to improve the retailing, we are going to replace all the purchase machines you heard about earlier. We're doing that in the course of this year. So there are things we need to do, and this seems a good opportunity to actually change how we deploy our colleagues on our stations at the same time as we look to improve the physical space, improve the retailing, and recognising that that takes some years to get through. We've got a funding challenge, as Simon has explained. We do need to start in that thinking now so that we can make the railway more self-funding and create the space for further investment. Yeah, just to build on what Mr. Allen said, I would, uh, when you look at the figures, uh, I would point to the fact that over the course of the pandemic years, we saw an even greater switch to online purchasing than there was just before the pandemic, and then also an increase in the number of passengers travelling who require assistance. So we've got to respond to that change. Uh, we all know, just for, you know, in our own lives, how purchasing using cards rather than cash has changed through the pandemic as we were encouraged to use contactless forms of payment. So the industry uh, has, has seen those changes already coming through and now is the right time to bring forward these changes so that we modernise our industry so that it, it is fit for the future. Yeah, I think from an Avanti West Coast perspective I can point to how we've uh, progressively evolved our retailing arrangements in recent years. If you go to somewhere like 
Birmingham International, it's open plan where staff are available uh, to sell tickets and also support customers uh, using ticket vending machines. We've also significantly uh, made significant investment in our ticket vending machines over the past four or five years, such that the overwhelming majority of products are actually available on them. So it is a continual evolution that has been happening in response to changes in customer uh, demand and requirements. Just before you, you come in, uh, Simon, uh, you know, representing the RDG as the umbrella uh, group, um, I'm still really keen to know why this is happening so comprehensively at once across the industry when would it not be more sensible, as we heard from uh, Anthony Smith in the previous panel, perhaps to pilot some uh, innovations and changes, see how they bed down, uh, and then learn from that before making wider uh, reforms. There's a lot of public concern that this is just happening across the board for, as you perhaps alluded to, purely cost reasons. Well, cost is, is a part of it, but primarily we're following the needs of our customers and the demands of our customers. Um, this year, uh, around 80% of the tickets that have been issued are either bought online through digital <coughs> channels or they are with customers tapping in, tapping out from, from gate lines or, or machines on platforms. And so with 80% of our customers not going anywhere near a ticket office, with, uh, it, by ticket issues, only about 7% of tickets are issued within uh, ticket offices through this year. About 10% are issued at, at ticket vending machines. So the customer trends have been very clear over, over recent years. And I think part of our and uh, our dilemma here is if we pilot and we uh, uh, take this piece by piece, then what we find very often in the rail industry, there are, there are lots of reasons not to do things. And so we're going ahead with this as one of the proposals as part of not only workforce reform, but also reforms to our fares system, our ticketing systems as well, to try to make fares simpler for customers. Uh, and there's a whole set of uh, parallel uh, activities that we're looking at alongside these ticket office proposals to make sure that we're making it easier for customers to buy the tickets they need. A couple of supplementaries on that. Firstly, you say you're listening to your customers. And yes, there are lots of people. I'm one of them who rarely uses a ticket office now, buy it online or at a machine. But there is a minority who do need it. The analogy was given by my colleague, those who don't want to use a scan and go at the supermarket but want to go through the, uh, the, the normal checkout. <clears throat> people who don't have access online, people who have access needs, tourists who come and don't understand the, the real system. Are you listening to them? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're listening to our customers through this consultation process. And we think actually it's a better offer for those customers to have our staff moving out from behind those ticket offices into a place where they can engage with those customers and understand their needs more directly through a, a direct conversation with them. Uh, one final question, and we will dig into some of these issues, uh, but just one final question from me at this point. Has this proposal genuinely come from the industry or have you been asked by government to initiate this? I think there is consensus that there is a need for reform. I think the government agree with that, with their plan for rail. The industry agrees with it. I think our staff agree and support the need for reform as well. And the unions do as well. So there's consensus about that need for reform. Uh, these proposals are ones that have come from, from industry as uh, a way of, again, making sure we can follow our customers' needs when they need uh, help from our staff and making sure we can hit some of the other targets that we have across the industry. Appreciate the proposals come from you, but were you asked by government to bring them forward? We're always asked to manage costs of the industry uh, tightly uh, under the current contracts across the industry as well, but we're also absolutely listening to the needs of our customers, and we think these proposals do both. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much, Chairman. I want to come straight back to Richard Allen, and you've used um, the example of both Bicester and Oxford um, uh, on your line. I would say they're outliers. How many other of the stations on your line enjoy the levels of customer service that you provide at those two stations that have a shopping village and a tremendous amount of outward visitors, i.e. inward 
um, Tories. So there are new build stations that were built in the mid-2010s, but we've also converted an existing uh, traditional station building, if you like, at Aylesbury, which has got, uh, doesn't have a, a glass window, and we serve customers uh, there in an open plan environment where staff are free to walk around the station. So we want to take that principle and that experience and to adopt that on our other network. Mark, Mark, how many other stations on your line experience the same levels of customer service, so your normal daily passengers... Uh, or those who perhaps are infrequent travellers experience the same levels or opportunity of customer service as those people who visit wherever they're from. So there, are, so there are 23 staff stations. The two that I've described that are a new open plan environment were purpose built. So if that's a, a, you know, a model, a principle to follow, we have two of them. And we also have a hybrid model at Aylesbury, which was converting, adapting an existing interior environment in a traditional building. And then the rest are fairly traditional where you've got the glass, colleagues behind the glass, one, two or three windows available at different times of the day. It's one of the other panel members has talked about reform. We'd accept reform, obviously. But would you accept regulation to ensure that those stations that currently have levels of customer service with people in a ticket office, <coughs> if the regulation said that you had to have the same amount of man hours every week or every month serving people, customers, your passengers on so, the concourse? Would so you accept that? Would you accept that regulation? And yes or no answer? That level Putting you on the spot, yes or no answer? Don't oh. be a politician. Yes no, or no, answer. no. I'm going to I'm going to explain my thinking, and then I'll exp- I'll give you an answer. So, I would like the ability to reflect demand and to reflect where we uh, change our service specifications. So, if we change our timetable and we've got different services starting earlier or starting later, and how we deploy our people, then I would like, as the MD, the flexibility to deploy the 900 people that work at Chilton in a way that, with consultation with trade union reps best meets the needs of customers. So in terms of Bicester Village and Oxford Parkway, we're not proposing to change how we deploy staff there because that works. You're not, that's a necessity that you've got the amount of people there. I have, I'm, I'm thinking of the rest of your I passages. Have a substantial amount who, of reg- commutes who perhaps would like to have the yeah. same levels of service. So we have substantial regulating, regulation, as I heard from Stephanie. We have, in my case, a contract of 500 pages with the Department for Transport. We have a lot of things that we need to comply with. Uh, and one of the things that we are happy to talk about with the DFT is saying we've got 900 people, this is how we're deploying them, this is how we intend to serve customers at those stations because it's the right thing to do, to serve those customers in the way that I've described. You understand the concerns of the previous panel members that we've had this morning and so I'm going to come back to, to Simon and say you, you said you accepted reform. Would you accept yes or no regulation putting in place to say that you have to have the same amount of staff hours? I, 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 facing. I, I think the, the point about regulation and the Schedule 17 is really about ticket sales and ticket offices. It only re- it refers tangentially to staff numbers and staff members. We think the proposals that we have uh, will both maintain but also improve the interaction that our staff have with customers. Uh, and so we don't think that's really guided by Schedule 17. Um, and we, we were happy to make the um, the, the commitment that, that actually these proposals do improve our interaction with staff. <coughs> I think it's important that we, I think it's important as Richard outlined that we have that flexibility to make those changes in response to not just changes in customer behaviour but also those regular changes that happen in respect of the timetable as well. I mean ultimately we want to grow our railway back as has already been said we are £10 million a day more dependent on the taxpayer now as an industry uh, than we were uh, £10 million a day absolute uh, now. So we, we need to get the industry uh, we all back get that, to being... Would you accept some regulation on, on making sure that... I, I, I think the devil, the devil is in the detail that the industry as needs always. to be responsive to uh, customer needs and there are, um, uh, you know, th- th- I guess there's a materiality uh, sense there as well in terms of uh, how, you, how you draw the line yeah, with those sorts of things. Uh, David, giving you the opportunity to answer as well, but I'm conscious I'll be coming back to the chairman. In practice, it's not an issue. Uh, at LNER, our plans will always be to staff our stations from first train to last train. We need that for accessibility needs, for operational needs, for security needs. So having additional regulation just won't make a difference to what we do uh, at a practical level at our stations. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Gab. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. <clears throat> I am in a urgent question before the summer recess. Um, I was concerned, in fact, many members were concerned with consistency because um, in the letter I just received from the Minister, he does state it's a fairly bland letter, we're not all in it, as, as some, a lot of ministerial letters are, 
Uh, it says train operators are responsible for deciding how to ensure sufficient access to ticketing services um, at their station. So, uh, stations. So, looking at LNER and Avanti, um, LNER, looking at the, the figures on the website, state that uh, in Waverley and London Kings Cross, only 6% of ticket sales are currently at the ticket office. Um, Avanti, the, f- the only figure I can get is 12% from ticket offices. Would you dispute these figures? That I'm, either of you dispute the figures, 6% and 12% for Avanti? I would say that on our website it's very clear on a station-by-station basis what the sales are okay. through ticket offices and at Glasgow Central it's 1% of journeys. It's 1% at Glasgow indeed. Central? Yes, indeed. Well, that, that doesn't explain the queues that I see at the Glasgow Central ticket office on a regular basis. Would you dispute that there are queues at the Glasgow Central ticket office? Well, there are, there are certainly uh, people interacting with, with, with our staff in the ticket office at Glasgow Central, but the thrust of our proposals here is to make sure that we have staff that are more readily visible and accessible uh, to customers when they arrive at the station. Many customers who go to the ticket office go there with uh, queries, uh, which can be more readily answered uh, by staff on the concourse, and that's what we're proposing to do. And as it's come up in the previous session, how many people, how do you register or count um, how many people come up with queries to the service, to the ticket office currently? As well, opposed to folk who are buying tickets? W- whilst we measure tra- transactions in terms of sales, I'm not a- aware of any uh, mechanism to, to capture uh, other queries, but you know, we, we, we nonetheless, from our teams on the ground, have great insight into what, what, what's actually happening. I've personally you know, spent time with ticket office colleagues and, and seen that you know, quite a significant proportion of interactions at the ticket office counter or from behind the window are, are actually in relation to queries for uh, tickets that have already been sold. Okay, I'd be keen to engage further with you on your figures for Glasgow Central to, to interrogate them after um, following the, the, um, the committee this morning. What changes to your staffing complement do you envisage at Glasgow Central for if these changes go ahead as planned? Well, we, we um, like uh, David has, has just said for, for LNER, um, staff uh, stations from first train to last train. Uh, Avanti West Coast uh, is the station operator at 16 stations and also is lead retailer to further four stations which are managed by Network Rail. Uh, that includes uh, Glasgow Central. So um, we have uh, very clearly in our, in our consultation uh, set out that we intend to continue to provide a staffing presence from first train to last train to support customers and to provide those accessibility uh, needs, to support those accessibility needs. OK, but that didn't... So how, how many jobs will be lost at Glasgow Central? How many hours, what percentage of current staffing hours um, will be lost at Glasgow Central? Well, we, we are part of a live uh, consultation here. It's a meaningful consultation, as Anthony Uh, said earlier it's not a a done deal the industry and individual operators are listening uh, to feedback so clearly you know at at the moment uh, you know we have an outline position which we have provided uh, to our trade unions uh, as we are legally obliged to do um, under under the relevant uh, legislation but clearly the end position will depend on how the consultation is concluded. I appreciate that and you have clearly you've just stated you have current plans that you'll be aware of the consultation that happened in Scotland under for the Scott Rail ticket offices, which fundamentally changed the, um, the proposals as a result. So that there may well be changes, but you have a current plan. How many jobs would be lost at Glasgow Central if your plans go ahead? Well, on the on the staffing hours, and I'll, I'll come to the the, the details. Uh, on the staffing hours, uh, we're not proposing any reduction. Uh, there at all. The station will be, be staffed from uh, four o'clock in the morning till uh, half past half past midnight. We are only one of uh, several organisations that have staff at... Um, Appreciate that, yeah. So there'll be staff there, but how many staff will be there compared to current staffing levels? Um, well, we, we have um, about uh, uh, 20, 27 staff, I think it is, at the moment at, uh, at Glasgow Central. And these proposals would, 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 if they were enacted in full, as we proposed, reduce that number by about nine or ten.
nine or ten. All right. We, but we, I must stress, it, we are only one of the organisations that provides uh, customer support and, 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 and presence at, really appreciate uh, at that the station. And, but I'm grateful for the for the answer. But I'll, but I'll come over to LNER and, and East. So you're currently planning to keep this, the your ticket office open. Yep. These are both extremely similar services. Um, central Central Belt of Scotland, well with additional services, but largely from Edinburgh Waverley to, to London, uh, from Glasgow Central to, to Houston. Um, why a different approach? Well, I can also, also ask in terms of jobs, how many jobs you expect to lose in, in Edinburgh despite keeping a ticket office open? How many jobs do you expect to go? But why a different approach? Sure. So, first of all, in response to the number of staff, I don't have the precise number for Edinburgh. I'll come back to you afterwards in writing if I can. In, so, the, if I can just take you through the process that we followed at NER, because we have 13 uh, stations that we, where we have a ticket office that we manage. Uh, our plans are to keep six of those open and uh, to move uh, the staff at seven of them from behind the glass onto the concourse. What we did in deciding which... Uh, to make uh, changes at where we've consulted is we looked at the ticket sales at each station, we looked at the demographics as to who was using each of those stations, uh, how many customers used the ticket machines and things like that, and, and we assessed it on that basis. When you look at a station such as Edinburgh Waverley or York or London King's Cross, these stations are uh, you know, characterised by the high number of tourists that are using them, for example. Uh, as well as the people who are currently using the ticket office for specific needs. So we put all of that data, we crunched all of that data through, uh, considered what our future customers need uh, and built our proposals around them. We will be making changes at Edinburgh Waverley Station. Uh, we're looking to change the footprint of the travel centre so that we can provide new customer features, such as a passenger assistance lounge, so that those passengers who've booked assistance have somewhere comfortable to wait. Um, but that's the process that we followed. Um, is Andy wrong to close the tech office at Glasgow Central? Would you make the same decision? Well, I think one of the things that, um, as you'll be aware, at uh, Glasgow Central Station, there are uh, a yes. couple of ticket offices. Uh, there's also a ticket office at Glasgow Queen Street. And, you know, I'm sure that Andy and his team have taken into account the needs of what their customers need in the future. They are completely different routes, uh, serving different uh, communities and, and you know each train operator is able to assess the needs of their customers for themselves and clearly that's what Andy's done and that's what we've done at LNER. I wasn't expecting you to throw Andy under the bus there but, but if you could both, I appreciate if you could both write to the com committee to um, give us some more detail on, ticket, on the ticket sales at Edinburgh and in Glasgow so that we can compare and contrast the, the approaches that would be um, that would be useful. Um, but anyway, back to the 12% figure, we've heard this many times that on average, obviously Glasgow Central seems to be incredibly low at 1%, but 12% um, but um, is the average in terms of tic tickets now bought at ticket offices. What do we know or what do the, the, the operators know about the characteristics of the customers who are responsible for that 12%? And I'll start with yourself, Richard. So in terms of our uh, overall sort of transaction level, the number of journeys that have been retailed at the ticket office has halved in the last three years and it's now down to about eighteen percent of journeys. Eighteen for you guys. Eighteen percent yeah, okay. of journeys are retailed at the ticket offices and that's half of what it was uh, three years ago. So um, depending on the level of investment that different companies have had, that journey's been either accelerated or playing a bit of catch up and our ability to retail through other means. We need a bit of investment to do that and to upgrade the TVMs as we heard earlier on. We are replacing the Pertus machines in the course of this year. So um, we do have around about 5% of transactions through cash. The rest of it is non-cash transactions across uh, all the journeys bought on Chilton. So we are very keen to make sure that we have a sort of complementary parallel progress of investing in the retail. <clears throat> but in that transition period, we'll also have the devices on which we retail our ticket offices are portable and we will still have them available to retail existing products that you can buy today uh, over the ticket office counter when we come out behind the glass so that we're satisfying current needs, current products as we transition and invest in retail. Um, that, that's useful because it answers, answers my next question but my question here, and perhaps you didn't pick me up, was the 12 percent or sorry 18 percent when it comes to children what are the characteristics of the people who are buying tickets from the ticket office is it mainly elderly people is it 
disabled people? What are the, what are the characteristics? Have you got? Have you been able to measure? I need to, is it I, need to, I, need, I need to come back to you in terms of that specific uh, breakdown, but I can give you examples of even yesterday I was at High Wycombe Ticket Office and looking at the number of people buying uh, straightforward transactions, looking for information, some journeys that could easily have been bought on the machine and were bought on the machine. So it, it would vary by location, and I'll come back to you about that breakdown. I don't have that hand. Okay, but on that question, David, have you got a figure for Elnia? Yeah, I, I actually uh, well, uh, I'll characterise it, I suppose, rather than give you specific figures. I, I think there is a group of people who use ticket offices who could use other uh, modes of purchasing tickets, but they need that help, that human interaction, frankly, because our ticket uh, structure in the UK is probably a bit too complicated. We can argue you on that. We can argue you. Indeed. So, um, you know, people do need that that reassurance from a member of staff. That's one of the things that we will be looking to preserve um, through the changes. It's just the case that instead of the member of staff being behind a pane of glass and behind a counter, they will be in front of that pane of glass able to help a customer on a sort of more personal basis. Um, yes, I think uh, certainly from customers I've spoken to, uh, elderly customers I would say are concerned uh, about these changes. That's probably reflected in the range of consultation responses there's been. Uh, so we have got to think about that. We have got to uh, take that into account in designing what we do going forward. And absolutely, as a train operator at LNER, and I'm sure I speak for my colleagues, you know, we are taking on board the feedback from customers and we'll be reviewing the responses alongside Transport Focus so that we get it right for people. And Andy, do you have any figures for who's, well, 1% at Glasgow Central, but at 12% elsewhere? Across our um, 20 locations where we either run the stations ourselves or are the lead re retailer at the network around managed stations, it's 6% on average. There are some stations that are more than that, but you know our review of the tickets that are sold through the ticket office suggests that you know the overwhelming majority, it's something like 99% of tickets, could be available through other means. And as David has said, part of these proposals in terms of making our staff more visible, supporting customers uh, when they arrive at the station, you know, will enable those tickets to be uh, to be sold either through the TVMs or through the retailing equipment that those uh, specialist people will have on the concourse. Um, I, I, I would say yes, if you're moving out the concourse, but if you're removing 40% or thereabouts of the workforce, then that visibility is certainly diluted to say, to say, to say the least. But just further to that question, uh, do, do, do all three of you have? Figures for the total number of tickets that sold um, each week um, through your ticket office, current ticket offices, in terms of total number of transactions. Well, in terms of journeys on Chilton this year, we're forecasting around about 22, 23 million. So, in terms of that journey, uh, then taking a rough rule of thumb, 18 percent. Noting some of those journeys will be returns or being seasons. You can, you know, I'll come back to you with the detail. Um, yeah, get some of them will be seasons, weeklies, etc. So, 22 million doesn't mean 22 million transactions. Um, but that, Except that is if, if you guys don't have the detail to hand, uh, again, if you feel free to write to the committee, yeah. but it's a useful um, uh, figure for us to have. Uh, do you have the figures to hand, either of you, in terms of the total number of tech transactions at ticket offices each each week? I have it as a percentage. Uh, we'll get to you the total number. No, that, if, you could, uh, if you could, that, that would be very useful. Yeah. Um, I suppose, lastly, for me, um, <laughs> you've already mentioned it in terms of com complexity. Um, complexity of ticket fares in, in this country, and that's something we would welcome a full review on. Um, but why do you think that this proposal is being made, given the complexity um, we currently have in the country, uh, before any fair simplification, which made which would make these proposals a lot simpler, um, and any other ticket and reforms that are uh, promised in the plan for rail? Why are we doing this? Why are we putting the cart before the horse? In other words, and I'll I'll start with Simon. Yeah, thank you've been left alone for me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But, but maybe I can also add a, a part of an answer to your previous question as well. I'll come back to your, your, uh, your, your why now question. Um, in, in terms of the breakdown of, of people buying tickets at ticket offices, I think we see the full range of, of customers buying from ticket offices. But one data point that might be of interest is that, that when we look at our disabled person rail card holders, mm -hmm. so more than 50% of tickets sold to disabled person rail card holders uh, are bought digitally. Uh, only about 20% of those tickets actually are actually bought in ticket offices. And 
I think we sometimes forget that actually for some types of disability, having the confidence that you've bought your ticket, you don't have to queue up at a ticket office, you have the level of anxiety reduced uh, uh, because you know what you're buying and you know what you paid for before you get to the, the station and you don't necessarily have to arrive half an hour beforehand to be able to, uh, to deal with the uncertainty of waiting at the ticket office is, is helpful. And that's right for, for some of us. Customers. Would, would you just before would you accept though that twenty percent uh, is quite a large percentage of, of that cohort? Though? Of course, and and, um, uh, and uh, again we are looking at ways uh, to make sure not only can we support um, uh, better access to tickets through digital means and through uh, ticket vending machines, but so many of our customers will be served by uh, the same staff coming out in front of the glass and serving them directly, sometimes uh, helping them with the machines they have themselves, but sometimes selling them a ticket through mobile ticket sales machines as well. So in many of our stations, that's how how the system will work. Um, On why now? Why now before fair simplification? So, So... uh, reform is overdue. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been waiting for this for many, many years. It was delayed by COVID. The plan for rail was published some time ago. Uh, there are teams working on specific changes to make fares simpler and make yeah, tickets easier to access as part of this proposal. The specific things that can only be bought from ticket, o- ticket office will, will start to unpick. In the background as well, there's a whole team of people working as part of a separate reform programme, fares ticketing retail reform, which are aimed to simplify the fares system overall, and a new fares model is being prepared. Yeah, but would it, would, should that reform have happened before that reform? Well, I, I, think, I think I should say, because it hasn't really come up in any of the uh, panels so far, that we We are looking for more people to use the railway. We're looking for more people to be able to buy tickets. We're looking for those with accessibility needs to not only for more people to use the the railway, but for those people who do to use it more. We will not let the changes that we're making get in the way of more people using the railway. So if somebody cannot find the ticket on a TVM or cannot find somebody to buy a ticket from in, in a station, we will have signage at the station to encourage them to say, you should just board a train and you buy your ticket at the next available point. Well, that, that's, that's an interesting there. point, Mr Moorhead. I've got Good. a constituent who did just that and was fined £1,000. Well, I, 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 think, I think we will, we will roll uh, these changes out with new guidance to our <coughs> staff who understandably are concerned about, about fare avoidance and about fraud because that is an issue on the railway. But actually, one, one we will give new guidance as part of these proposals. But also, there's a whole uh, a load of work around training for staff to make sure that the railway is more inclusive. Uh, and I think that will carry on bearing fruit across the, uh, the, the, each of the um, train operators. I'm conscious I've taken up far too much time. So for the three of you, would it have been better... Had fair simplification taken place before this current proposal? So can I, as Simon said, fares reform is overdue. Our customers tell right. us very clearly it should have happened a long time ago. I think we would agree it should have happened by now. At LNER, we're actually doing a couple of pilots uh, to, to test this and to bring it forward. Uh, and I, in an ideal world, we, sh- we would have reformed our fare structure already. Already so. So yes is the answer. So before this reform, we should have carried out the other reform. What we're doing better. Uh, any disagreement from from yourselves, Richard or Andy? I think the um, for fair reform and simplifying how we retail our journeys um, would preferably go hand in hand. But as I've explained, uh, the investment in modernising how we serve our customers and our stations is overdue. In some cases, certainly overdue. Uh, in my train company um, and want to press on with that and I hope that fares reform comes along quickly so that we can do uh, both and give our customers a better experience and grow the railway which you know I think all of us want to achieve. Okay thanks all and thanks for your patience Jim. Thank you. Um, just one supplementary now and the, I just want to probe how you as individual uh, operators in developing your proposals for each station cooperated with other operators so, for example, one of my local stations, Milton Keynes Central, ticket office is uh, London Northwestern, but Avanti are a significant uh, service provider. How did you liaise with them and so to think this is they they were London Northwestern were in the lead for uh, the proposal for that station, but did they speak to you about what your needs were at uh, that station? 
So, certainly I can speak for Avanti and you talk about Milton Keynes, uh, their chair. Uh, there, there was a dialogue uh, with not just other operators but also Network Rail as well, recognising, as I said earlier, uh, we are a lead retailer at four uh, Network Rail managed uh, stations. Uh, but as part of the uh, ticketing and settlement agreement and the Schedule 17 consultation, any lead retailer that's proposing a change also has to consult with affected operators. So that has happened as part of this TSA process as well. Is that the, your experience as well across the, the, the process? Thank you. Zara. Thank you, uh, Chair. And this just builds on a, a point that was made previously. When the proposals were made, was this signed off by the DFT or ministers before they were published? I think, I think we said earlier on that the, the need for reform was widely understood by, um, by the department, by train operators as well. Um, we have uh, shared and given previews of the proposals that are, are being, being made, but they are made by the rail industry. And so they're, and they're triggered under the ticketing and settlement agreement, which is the rail industry rule set, and our engagement and our consultation, which is a genuine consultation with passengers, uh, goes through the, the passenger bodies. So actually the department has a role, but the department has a role at the end of this process rather than at the beginning. So the department at no point signed off the, appro- the, the, the proposals that you made? Well, they're, they're all, they all have to be contained within a business plan. Uh, that is shared with the markets teams that are a, a part of the Department for Transport. And so they have to have a, a commercial plan behind the, uh, the people impact and the changes to ticket hours and staffing hours. So those had to be shared with the department as part of the preparation to make sure that the business plan uh, was understood and, and was sound as part of those market teams. Uh, um, so they could have a look at it beforehand. Okay, and... The RMT have, uh, have basically said that the ticket office closures are a, a done deal. <laughs> this is involving redundancies and, especially in Avanti's case, uh, the leasing of some ticket offices. So, is, firstly, Andy, is that correct, that that's the case with Avanti, where they are looking to let some of the ticket offices already? Because when we look at this as a consultation process, obviously, when you're seeing this happening, potentially on the railways, then... then it says one thing um, and does another. Um, abs- absolutely not. There are there are no uh, plans uh, uh, that have been hatched at all in terms of existing ticket office spaces being repurposed. This is a genuine consultation. We want to hear what our customers and stakeholders have to say as an industry, and we are you know already starting to receive that feedback from the passenger bodies, and we will respond and reshape our proposals accordingly. So there are no ticket offices currently that are, are up for let? N- no. Okay. And uh, in terms of the redundancy notices, is there, is there anything across the railways that we're seeing there? Of the well, I think under the uh, relevant legislation, uh, there is a requirement uh, to issue Section 188 notices if there is potential for a certain threshold uh, to be met. So that was why those notices were issued by some of the operators uh, at the start of this process, but that was, you know, part of the, the legal obligation. Is there anybody that wants to, Simon, do you want to come in first? Well, they'll just, just agree with that. So the, uh, my understanding from, from uh, we have a coordinating role amongst the operators in terms of the consultation, uh, and the, uh, the section when they take notices were shared and then paused. So uh, the staff were put on notice of a potential redundancy, but then that process was paused. Mm-hmm while we go out and consult with our customers and with the passenger bodies as well. So that means that there are no formal proposals until we get to the end of the passenger consultation process. So there are, there are pretty much no implications for the staff until we get to the end of this, and then we have clarity about the proposals that, are, uh, uh, that exist at that point. So I, under, I understand that, but can you see the problem where the message to, to everybody is we are not looking to reduce staff or hours the staff members that are there are going out to be on the platforms and help in other, other ways. But then with, with some of the companies, we're seeing a reduction in the hours. So it completely contradicts what's being said uh, by the train operating companies. 
So, so there is a v variety of proposals across the country, because, uh, which is largely driven by the estates that those, those operators run. Some have very big stations and only a handful of them. Some have some very small stations and, and very, very many of them. So that's why there's a variety of those proposals. Uh, and so the nature of those proposals changes and had to be operated by operator, which is why we're grateful to Transport Focus for being flexible in terms of having this a station-by-station -station <laughs> consultation. That's the right thing to do. Um, but at the end of that... Um, yeah, we, we, we will be coming up with uh, listening to the, uh, the customer feedback that we're getting, and if there are changes necessary to those proposals, then we'll make them. Thank you. Uh, Jack. Thank you, Chair. And uh, firstly, to Simon, in terms of uh, the number of stations uh, that are going to be left without uh, as many staff as they've got now, and which stations are going to um, see fewer staff uh, than uh, currently is the case. How many of those uh, under the current proposals would be left without staff altogether? Is, is, have you got any figures on that? Well, uh, the, 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 the figures for each uh, individual operator uh, are published, but I would, I would say that this isn't a new situation. So something like 43% of the population of, of stations across the country at the moment are currently unstaffed. Another 40% We understand that, but we're trying to understand staffed. how much it's going to reduce those stations which are currently staffed, currently have staff um, now, but are going to see fewer than they've got. So how many of those stations are going to be reduced from the current situation? I understand totally that we have stations up and down the network, stations which uh, have fewer people using them that don't have staff at the moment, quite right. But we want to understand how many stations that currently have staff and have been designated staff are not going to have them in the future. So if I may, I'll write to you with a specific number around that, and it's partly because I'm conscious that we're right in the middle of this consultation at the moment, and, and it's, it's entirely possible that those proposals will change by the time we get to the end of this consultation period, um, because we've had some you know, robust feedback, very useful feedback from customers, and we're listening to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of um, the hours, and Sarah's just mentioned um, about some of the issues with hours, we see particularly, and this is uh, directed at Andy, at Stoke Station, for example, you're going to be reducing um, the hours of ticketing support that's available quite significantly, actually. I've got the figures here that currently, Monday to Friday, um, the ticketing support availability is from 5.55 in the morning um, till 8 o'clock at night. That's going to <coughs> excuse me, reduce down to 7.15 in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, which is quite significant reductions, isn't it? How many of the stations across Avanti's network are seeing similar sorts of reductions? Well, as part of these proposals to move our staff from behind counters or glass in ticket offices to be more customer-facing, we've taken the opportunity to redefine the hours over which that retailing support would be available based on the data. So the reality of it is that the hours that you've quoted there for Stoke, um, you know, at the end of the, of, of the day in the early evening, there are very, very few uh, ticket sales actually happening. So this is all about making sure that we provide the right level of resource in the right way to support customers going forward. Is forwards. that happening at every single station across the network, it, that it, those it, reduction, that well, sort of I, reduction I can, in hours? I, I can talk for the 20 stations where we are lead retailer and we are taking the opportunity to, to change those hours. The extent of the change does vary from one location to another depending upon customer, customer requirements, but it is a data-driven approach. And what so should somebody you know, who arrives at 4.30 on a Monday afternoon do if they can't buy a ticket? How, how, how would they deal with that sort of situation if somebody arrives now, you know, well, once these proposals yep. have gone ahead at 4.30 so th There are um, <coughs> already, um, you know, we've, we've said uh, our stations will be staffed from uh, first train to last train. At somewhere like Stoke, there is a gate line, which is, you know, very close to the how ticket vending machines. How would they buy a ticket? How would they, buy, how would they be supported to buy a ticket? Because there's not going to be any ticketing support after four o'clock? Well, specialist ticketing support, but there will be other staff under the proposals that will be there at other times of day that What's would be able to provide some... What's the specialists? It's the uh, level, of, level of knowledge that, that individuals would have on, on specific ticket products and, and, and so on. So they're not but going to get the level of service that they would 
um, in those hours. But equally, this is a data-driven approach in terms of what is the propensity for customers to turn up in those hours and require that level of support, which is why we've made the proposals that we've done. And ultimately, Simon has talked through how, as an industry, um, we need a, 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 an, an approach in terms of where customers aren't able to buy uh, tickets. I mean, we've, we've heard earlier about the accessible travel policies that train operators have got at, at Avanti, our, our, our ATP already um, you know, has provision in it uh, as to where if a customer uh, arrives at a station and due to a disability they're not able to purchase a ticket, how they're able to get on board the train, buy a ticket on board without any financial penalty. So those arrangements already exist where you know, customers with accessibility needs are not able to, uh, to purchase a ticket. In terms of uh, LNAR and Chilton, is it a similar situation that you're going to see significant reduction in the hours of that ticketing support? Uh, maybe LNAR first? Yeah, so, uh, so in relation to the uh, stations where, we'll, where we're proposing to close the travel centre and move people forward, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to upskill our people so that they can provide ticketing assistance to customers. And we haven't determined the, the hours at which that will be provided yet at those stations. Uh, we've got to work that detail through. But we're very focused on providing an excellent customer service for our customers. We want to win more people back to the trains. And if you know we need to provide staff at any time of the day, uh, to help customers, then, then we'll work towards that and we'll look to do that. Uh, but we haven't made such detailed plans uh, yet. Have you made detailed plans on reduction in hours? Our, the hours that we have are stations open where we have staff currently will stay the same under these proposals. What we are proposing is to do the out behind the glass, as we've talked about, extend that principle and have that ability to both retail through the current system to improve the ticket uh, machines and provide that functionality and then we can have a look at that uh, as we get into the next two or three years but at the moment the proposal is subject to listening to feedback to have the same hours, same staff uh, availability uh, as we do today. One further question for Simon around um, what's uh, proposed by RDG in terms of no, new uh, mobile assistance teams. Um, what will these actually look like in terms of the support that they can offer to those stations that are, have no longer got any staff in them? Well, I think that there's, a, there's two separate things here. One is uh, some operators um, have proposed that there might be roving teams that, who are able to be in particular locations at a particular time of day or making sure that if they uh, understand there's a particular need or a particular local event going on or whatever it may be, that they can be uh, managed accordingly. But I think I would also uh, pick up on the thing that we haven't really uh, touched on in this panel, it was touched on in the previous one from ORR, which was around the passenger assistance functions. And actually for those with separate accessibility needs, we've seen a very significant growth in the number of uh, customers who use passenger assist, which is uh, some, in the main it's pre-booked support to make sure that there is a member of staff waiting for that customer to either help them buy tickets or help them onto a train if they need those accessibility, uh, if they need accessibility support to get onto those trains. So I think we've seen a, a, a very significant rise in the use of that, and we've also seen an increase in the satisfaction of those customers who use it. So, so how will that roving support? Because obviously people with a disability don't just want to travel at one time of the day. They often want to travel at different times of the day. So how will that be aligned yep. to actually coordinate it with the support that's needed when that individual actually travels? Yes, so, so none of that restricts the sort of turn up and go railway. Turn up and go railway is still there. Uh, and if there, isn't, uh, if there aren't staff on the station at that particular time, then we'll get people to them as soon as we're able to, either through the passenger assistance function or through those, those mobile teams that you referred to. But I, I, would, I would counsel that the, uh, the, uh, the mobile teams are part of a proposal that is being consulted on. So all of that, I think, is still up for discussion. We need to get you know, the full uh, feedback from Transport Focus and London Travel Watch before we conclude that. Passenger assistance, however, is carrying on growing, carrying on growing in terms of its uh, capacity and ability to support those with, with different needs. How beneficial would it be, though, to you know just have a team there for one hour of a day? You know that doesn't seem incredibly beneficial for people who want to travel throughout the week. I think, I think it is 
uh, it is difficult and it will be a learning exercise for operators to try to optimise their, their use of staff across a particular network. But they do that with the uh, knowledge and experience of when customers are travelling within that network uh, and with the pattern of, uh, of uh, responses or needs that they see historically but also in the future as well. So I think that then becomes a, a planning exercise for those operators. But again, I would caution that to say that this is all part of the consultation. So let's see what, what, what we come to the end of that. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, you wanted a yeah, just a very very quick one. Back to the travel and go point that you mentioned, Simon. We heard earlier that this could be up to an hour before somebody actually gets to the station to assist someone. How is that classed as travel and go when someone could then be waiting 45 minutes for support to get on the train that they need to get on? As, as uh, uh, Stephanie described from the ORR, the uh, commitment for passenger assistance has moved down over the past few years from a 24-hour booking period right down to a two-hour booking period. And so we do encourage for those people who, uh, who need help to get onto a train in particular or other, other help at the station as well um, to seek to book that assistance so we can make sure there is somebody when they need it. But there is absolutely the option for anybody to turn up to a... Uh, a station, and if that station isn't staffed at that particular moment, uh, to call us and engage for more help, and we'll get somebody to them as soon as we possibly can. If there's somebody at a nearby station, we will seek to get that person to them. If it's somebody who has to come from further afield, uh, the commitment to uh, to meet that person within two hours is still there. And just uh, quickly, a further point, just on the um, hours and the reduction in staffing. I see at my own station at Accrington, there's usually only one person working there. And now we know that ticket offices are more than just selling tickets and, and you are stating that you're getting this person out there whilst, Andy, you just said the data is being driven on the sales of tickets. So how, again, do you justify that the reduction in staff correlates with the getting people back out onto the stations when there's nobody there from the hours now that exist on certain stations to, to what's being proposed? Well, I'd suggest that that's a question that's better directed in respect of the station operator for, for, for Accrington. I can talk for Avanti an, an stations that we have considered uh, customer requirements when we've formulated these proposals and we'll keep the, the proposals under review as a result of the feedback that we get from the passenger bodies. But it has been you know, an evidenced driven uh, proposal based on the change in customer behaviour, how customers buy tickets and, and when customers buy tickets. Uh, as Simon has, has said, the accessibility element in terms of assistance, passenger assistance and getting uh, people, customers who require assistance uh, on and off trains and through stations, those arrangements in respect of, uh, uh, of Avanti won't change as a result of this. Can I just add something? So in addition to ticket sales data, we of course do have passenger assistance data. So where passengers book assistance, that all goes into a system. We're able to analyse at which stations uh, the people requiring assistance travel, the times they travel, the days they travel, etc. So that data is also available in terms of us designing uh, the future staffing. But is that monitored? If somebody just entered a, entered a ticket office and said, look, I'm just needing slight support, would that be then logged with the, the train? Yes. Yeah, so, so Rail Delivery Group's introduced a new system, a new digital system that yes. staff use across the network now and turn up and go uh, assistance is put into that system so it's available, available to analyse after the, uh, the day of travel. Thank you. Um, I've got a set of questions I want to ask on uh, the, the sort of the accessibility of the formats for the consultation, but I'll return to those in a minute. I want to bring my other colleagues in first. So, Greg, if I could turn to you next. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Simon, uh, if I can come to you first on the question of the future of the ticket machines, um, vending machines. Uh, Rail de Delivery Group <coughs> in evidence said that where needed, ticket vending machines across the network will be improved and upgraded. What isn't clear in that is what to. What, what is the future of those vending machines? And if in particular I can ask, I'll come to Simon first and then maybe bring in others afterwards, Given that there are issues with ticket vending machines, um, both for general use of understanding them, they can be very complicated, but also for people with very specific um, needs, 
what are you doing to actually address that, to have machines in stations that people can understand and use? And actually, if you want to have that transition to everyone doing what, hands up, I do, buy everything on an app, isn't there a requirement to make those vending machines the same as the, the, the layout and the screen they would see on their laptop or on their phone or on whatever device they're using? I, I think it, it's, a, it's a really important question for us to try and get the balance right in terms of uh, how accessible some of these machines are. And that's not just uh, for those with uh, particular additional needs, but also for all of our customers as well, to try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, there, there, uh, if I can address this in two ways, I think some of our uh, commentary so far um, in some of RDG's public statements has talked about making sure that, that um, we can upgrade the capability of some of those machines to make sure they cover the same sort of uh, tickets that are available in ticket offices. So there's functions there to make sure that customers shouldn't be missing out if the ticket office is no longer available, but they can still access those tickets through the machine. It's not quite, quite where you were heading with the question. And so um, there's almost a second layer to this, which is making sure that those machines are as accessible as possible. Um, and there are two parts of that. One is that we have a, um, uh, trials that are underway at the moment to try to make sure that the, uh, with, with two uh, ticket vending machine manufacturers, um, to have a video interaction with uh, a person on the other end of, of, uh, of the uh, ticket vending machine as well. And clearly we have to be sensitive to those with, uh, with hearing needs as well and make sure that we can uh, help that. But even those with some level of hearing loss can sometimes uh, get advantage from having a video image of, high quality video image of, of, a, of the person they're talking to. So those are trials to see if they're effective. Um, uh, more widely, I think we make, make the, um, the assurance that any new machines that go into the network uh, will uh, be accessible. Um, fixing the current estate, I think, is probably um, a challenge for us right now, but it's a challenge that we address by making sure that we have the staff that we've talked about earlier available around those ticket vending machines to help people use them or to sell them a ticket from a, a mobile device that they might have with them. So there are different forms of being able to access um, uh, tickets, only one of which is the vending machine itself. But, but just, just, just within that, if we accept that there is a future, at least in the medium term, for vending machines, they're all different across the whole network uh, at the moment. They're all still fairly old tech, if I can put it that way. I was quite surprised, you know, given that what I said earlier, hands up, I can't remember the last time in at least 10 years I haven't just bought tickets on my phone, mm -hmm. having to, during the disruption uh, from the, the strikes earlier in the summer, find myself having to drive over to Tring to get a train into London because Sadly, Chilton weren't up and running in time. <laughs> um, still having to put this great long X, Y, Z, B, Q, Y, Z, Q code into the, into the machine. Is there actually a, a, a need here for greater, and you wouldn't normally hear me arguing for standardisation, but standardisation across the ticket vending machines, across all operators, across all stations in the country? I think, I think the variety of ticket vending machines reflects the fact that they come from different manufacturers, they're partly bought by different train operators, but if you are a customer who routinely uses the same station, as many of our customers do, they have a pattern of usage which is consistent, then, then actually I think the, um, yeah, many customers become familiar with the functions in an individual ticket vending machine. You're right, it's more difficult then to go to a completely different station. But I, but I would say, I, uh, earlier we heard a challenge is to say that ticket vending machines are not going to be um, extended. I, I really don't recognise that. There are some contracts for some operators that are coming to the end of life, but they will be recontracted. And so there will be either an extension to the existing arrangements that are there or potentially a procurement of new ticket vending machines that come out into the market as well. And again, the, the specification for those machines will make sure that they are as, as accessible as they can be, supported by the people who, uh, who will be available to help customers use them. Richard, David or Andy, do you have anything to add on that point? Just to say, I think the, um, 
the industry has installed machines at different points when there's been available investment and so you've seen some that are quite old and we heard about the very old machines that we are replacing this year uh, and recognise that the user um, experience varies and we understand that and in my particular case given the age of the machines we have that's why we'll continue to have our portable device that currently sits in the ticket office available alongside the machines for this transition period and we haven't defined that yet because we're still listening to the feedback. Okay, that, that's very helpful. Can I just move on? Um, some of these themes came up in earlier questioning but I just want to try and bring them together in one uh, and that is around this question of people concerned that once people are out from behind the glass that single point where they know where to find those staff well, how, how do you find them? Now, that's very straightforward to use personal experience in a station like Princess Risborough or Haddenham in my constituency where they're just not that big. It's yeah. not, it, you know, unless the staff are hiding out the other side of the car park, which is unlikely. But in some of those bigger stations, um, actually Aylesbury might well be a, a good example, Central Aylesbury, not Parkway, yeah. uh, might be a good example of that what have you learned from where you've been operating Vista Village where you've been operating Oxford Parkway now Aylesbury in terms of customers being able to find okay. those staff particularly those customers that perhaps uh, have a visual impairment and are relying on their guide dog to, to help them find where they need to go uh, or similar I think it's really important to have a focal point a reception desk that says that's the heart of the station, that's where you will find colleagues. Colleagues know how their customers behave, they often know their customers individually, they recognise them, they come in at the same time. I was at one of our smaller stations last week and Anna in the ticket office uh, does a brilliant job and customers, she was telling me that customers come into the car park, run for the train and she puts in their registration number in the machine to print out the car park ticket because she can remember that. So that's brilliant customer service, that's great knowledge. So actually, custom, colleagues working in these stations know when the busy times are, know when customers are likely to need help, and they already do go out and about. They go and look at the car park, they go and have a look at the litter on the platform, they go and look at any issues around the station estate. I think it's really important we listen to that feedback from colleagues and from accessibility groups to build in that focal point and that reception desk. I think it's really important we have that heart of the station that everyone knows where it is. And why would it be in any different place than the current where the ticket office is and providing that uh, continuity but design it in a way that brings colleagues out behind the glass? That, that, that makes sense, but I think uh, that there's more, that it's more complicated than that, isn't it? Because in a small station like um, Haddenham and Tame Parkway or, or Risborough, if you've got only a limited number of station staff available... Yeah and one member of staff is already, let's say, for example, over the bridge on the other side helping perhaps a passenger that needs assistance uh, getting a wheelchair onto the train or whatever it might be, and you've got someone else trying to plug in someone's registration to a ticket machine, yeah. well, that might be it, yeah. and there's going to be no one on that reception desk. Yeah. And whilst I fully accept and, and, and then that's a great surface for the service for the regular customers that the staff get to know isn't it the case that more often the people who are going to have a problem with buying a ticket or or, 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 or asking for advice yeah. on a route are not the regulars yeah. and are the people that those staff may have never seen before, they might be a tourist, they might be someone visiting, they might, who yes. knows coming for a medical appointment yeah. whatever it might be how, how are you going to get around that problem? So on our smaller locations, which tend to have a single staff member and their the hours will stay the same in the future, uh, generally speaking, they're one or two platforms, uh, and therefore the, the you know, staff member is able to see customers arriving and go to that point. At larger locations, we'll have to think through, in terms of that out behind the glass, you will have more than one member of staff. So does that mean the person on the southbound platform at Haddenham has got something that says, actually, there's a customer arrived at reception, they pressed a buzzer, can you come and help them? Uh, and if somebody's over in the far side in the car park, as you know, helping the customer there, how do you understand there's a customer waiting for you? And we will build that system in. We haven't prescribed it because we actually want to listen to the feedback and it, I think it will require uh, bespoke design for local stations because they're all, you know, got their specific circumstances. Thank you. Do any of you have uh, any views? I mean, clearly... 
Chiltern are already operating some stations like this. Are you operating any like this or got plans for how you will make staff visibly accessible? We're not using uh, the, the model yet. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues who used to manage a station came up with the, the concept of a HICSA. That's a high impact customer service area. And basically he used that as a device to say, uh, our customers gather at these points. Uh, you, as I'm uh, t talking to his team, he said, I want to see you at these points uh, whenever you can. So that whether that's on a platform or on a station concourse, a member of staff always uh, is looking out for customers who need assistance uh, whenever they can. Um, but clearly, uh, that, you know, our staff do many, many things. Uh, sometimes they will be dispatching a train, sometimes they will be getting other customers on board. Uh, and this is all about creating an atmosphere where our staff are flexible, agile, and ultimately providing that personal service that we're aspiring to deliver. Anything else? Uh, well, t 12 of our 16 uh, stations, the ticket office is currently the recognised place for uh, accessible travel needs. But as part of our proposals, we have identified alternatives and, and, and will you know, put those plans in place subject to the consultation. But very much uh, along the lines of what David has outlined, there would be a recognised place that is um, you know, geographically appropriate for how customers arrive at the station. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to conclude this session by 12. Um, Graham, so quick questions and answers. I'll, I'll be quick. I, I was going to ask Mr. Horn some questions uh, 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 about um, the service from Maya, but I'm, I'm going to go straight to Mr. Moorhead. It, it says on the CV, Mr. Moorhead, that, that, that you are the Chief Information Officer. Does that mean you're, you're responsible for gathering as well as disseminating information? And the reason I'm asking is, have you met with any of those organisations that we heard from in the first panel, Age UK, RNIB, SCORP, Transport for All? So, so two, yeah, two, I mean you personally. Two parts of that. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, leading the work that we're doing to coordinate the, the activity in terms of well, consultation. I'm, 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 I understand yes. that, yeah. but have, have yeah. you personally, as the Chief Information Officer, met with those organisations? So my colleagues have been meeting with them so, for more so than So you a year, haven't? More than a year. Okay, that's, that's all I wanted to know, right? Uh, you're arguing the cheat, really, aren't you, in, in the committee today? Because the, the points that were made about Schedule 7, you know, in relation to the only protection that we've got in terms of these ticket offices is that, that bit of legislation. Once you close these ticket offices, then there's no guarantees about staff. I mean, you can talk about interaction and discussions, but the truth is that there's no guarantee that the, once the ticket offices are closed, that the, the staff will be there. And in fact, Mr. Mellis let the cat out the bag because there's a third of the staff in Glasgow already uh, had redundancy notices. And we heard from the first panel that about a quarter of the staff nationally, about is, is it uh, 2,300 that have been made redundant? Well, they can't be redeployed in front of the, ga in front of the glass because they won't be there. I think, I think that's a formal process that had to happen to give them a notice of, of redundancy. You understand? Yeah. But it's yeah. your... In you, you see, this is, we've been sold a pup, to use a, a colloquialism, because the ministers uh, come in front of us and said, the service is going to be better. These staff that are behind glass are going to be out interacting with the customers and the public. Well, that's not quite the case, is it? Because a quarter of them are going to be made redundant. And there's no guarantees about how much longer the ones that remain will be on the platform because there's no statutory guarantees or protections for them. Isn't that true? So two things is, yes or no, is that true? Well, two, two things I would... No, I just want you to tell me. Is that true, what the previous panellists have told us, that the only statutory protection in law is this particular Schedule 17, and that won't exist after this goes through? It, it, it's not. So the operators have it's many... It's not true. The operators have many, many um, uh, requirements and regulations that they need to satisfy. Uh, the Schedule 17 is about selling tickets. It's really about retailing tickets. It's really not really about, about stuff at all. Uh, there well, are a whole set of commitments. If there's no ticket office, then it doesn't really apply, does it? <laughs> but, and, and that's partly because um, 
Customers are changing their behaviour to tap in and tap out and don't need a ticket office in many of the locations. Half of the ticket sales that we've had over this period of consultation, 170 million tickets have been issued over this period of consultation so far. More than half of those have been people tapping in and tapping out. And so they don't need to go anywhere near a ticket office. So well, that's what well, customers well, are telling that, us. That, 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 that may or may not be true because there are huge variations in where, where that happens. Yes. And I happen to know from discussions I've had, not just with the previous panels, but outside of, the, of this committee, how important it is for disabled people, for people who are blind and partially sighted. Um, the, the stations in my constituency are unstaffed. I don't think that's safe, to, to be candid with you, particularly for, for women travelling by themselves or, or for families who need assistance, push chairs and so on. But I, 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 I'm just concerned that this is a fait accompli that will have a diminution in the service and many people want to have a point of contact even if they don't want to buy a ticket, they want to seek advice, reassurance, uh, further information, maybe not frequent travellers, and, and, and the ticket office currently provides that. Can I, can I just come in on, on this? So it's not a fait accompli, it's a meaningful consultation, and you know clearly Anthony Smith has received a lot of feedback, and we're, we're going to listen to that as well. Uh, there are other regulations which uh, protect uh, disabled and other users in relation to accessibility. You've heard from ORR in relation to the accessible travel policies, which we're obliged to follow uh, under our license agreements. And if we don't follow them, then we get letters from ORR and we'll be asked to uh, up our game in terms of remedi remedial plans, etc. There's also the Equality Act, which gives a, a legal underpinning to all of these things. So there are other things that protect the needs of accessible people. And just in relation uh, to, to it, you know, is, is this going to be a worse deal for accessible people? I'll give you the example from LNER. Uh, at LNER, we will increase the number of people out on platforms able to provide assistance to customers uh, by somewhere between 80 and 95 people across our station estate. That's roughly a 20 to 25 percent increase in the staff available to deliver assistance. Well, I'm slightly perplexed by, by, by what you're saying. You're closing six of the 13 ticket offices. You're making a proportion, maybe about a quarter of the staff redundant. And, and, and yet you're saying that there's going to be more help available for longer. Yes. You, you must be, have the ability to square the circle then. So, so this is about multi-skilling the station team. So they're not just uh, sitting in a ticket office uh, selling tickets. They'll be upskilled and trained to also deliver customer assistance when that's needed. So this is about introducing a flexible, multi-skilled model on our stations. And if we do that, we'll be able to uh, improve the uh, assistance that we do give to customers who need it. Well, uh, if you were here for the earlier panels, I'm afraid there isn't much confidence from the people representing those with disabilities in, in your ability to deliver that. But I'm conscious of time, Chair. I'm sorry. Andrew. Thank, thank you, Graham. And I'm conscious too, and colleagues will want to, uh, yeah. to, to move on. Um, there are a number of questions I wanted to ask about the, uh, the, the way the consultation was made for people with... Uh, uh, you know, in accessible formats and the like, and uh, the, we've heard some very concerning evidence that uh, it wasn't consistent uh, and in a format that was accessible for many people. Um, so I hope there's a bit of a learning exercise uh, from that. Uh, but if I may, I'll write to you individually with uh, some specific questions uh, and be grateful if you could follow uh, up, with, uh, up on that. Uh, but for now, can I thank you all uh, for your time? It's been a long session. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground, uh, but I, I'm grateful again for your time. Thank you. Order, order.